Now Interior Secretary Ken Salazar testifies about the President's 2012 budget request for his agency. The request includes $358 million for regulating offshore oil and gas drilling, 50 percent more than the fiscal year 2010 budget. This is about three hours. The committee will come to order. The chair uh, notes the presence of a quorum. The Committee on Natural Resources is meeting today to hear testimony on the Department of Interior spending in President's fiscal year 2000 budget proposal. Under Committee Rule 4F, opening statements are limited to the chairman and the ranking member of the committee so that we can hear from our witnesses, uh, or hear as long as we can from our witnesses. However, I ask unanimous consent that to, to include any member that would like to have an opening statement uh, in the record without objection so ordered. Let's get started right away. And I, I, the chair wants to mention we, the secretary has been generous with his time. He's, he is going to be with us until 1 o'clock, and we want to utilize all the time that we possibly can. So I'm going to be very, very strict on the five-minute rule, and I will advise you of that and uh, uh, when we get uh, close you, we all know how the how the light, lights work and so I just want to remind people we're going to be as strict as we possibly can. Thank you Mr. Sal Secretary Salazar for being uh, here today while the committee did not unfortunately get a chance to hear you in the last two of the President Obama's budget we are very pleased for you to be here today when there is certainly a need to control federal spending. The purpose of today's hearing is to examine the spending and programs of the Department of Interior and the President's proposed fiscal year 2012 budget. As everyone is aware, our country is currently facing a $14 trillion debt. This debt is threatening our economy, our nation's ability to remain competitive in the future security of our children and our grandchildren. It's long past time to get serious about cutting spending and addressing this debt head on. This is re requires setting priorities and making tough choices on how best to direct scarce taxpayer dollars. When it comes to highlighting spending that taxpayers simply cannot afford, I must uh, bring attention, Mr. Secretary, to the $900 million President's budget request for the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which is primarily used to purchase federal land. This represents a $553 million increase over the 2008 levels. I, I say this because the Department of Interior has a maintenance backlog on public lands that is in the billions of dollars. So I believe the government has a responsibility to, to maintain and care for existing lands be spend, before spending money uh, that we uh, don't have on more and more and more land. In addition to spending, we'll examine how several Interior Department policies are directly costing American jobs. This includes the regulatory drought in uh, California's San Joaquin Valley where the government has withheld valuable water from communities, prioritizing the needs of a three-inch fish over thousands of American workers and their families. And the Department, uh, uh, Department's Office of Surf Surface Mining Reclamation and Enforcement's pursuit of sweeping changes to stream regulations that by their own admission will cost thousands of Americans jobs. Finally, no discussion about jobs is complete without mentioning the President's de facto moratorium on the Gulf of Mexico that has left thousands of workers without jobs. Gasoline prices has, have risen nearly uh, 20 uh, cents last week. Higher gasoline prices not only mean increased costs at the pump, but families must pay more for groceries and farmers and small business costs will go up. Higher gasoline prices have a substantial impact on every American and every part of our fragile economy. But instead of focusing on ways to produce our own American energy, this administration is deepening America's dependence on unstable and hostile foreign countries. The de facto mor uh, drilling moratorium in the Gulf is simply the latest example of this. The official moratorium on deep water drilling was lifted over four months ago, yet the administration just this week, and I'm glad they did, issued their first permit. The people of the Gulf need more than just one token permit. That one permit will not put thousands of, of uh, workers back uh, to, uh, to work. 
I also hope to hear uh, further details on today's $358 million budget request for the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management Regulation and Enforcement. This is a $119 million increase above the fiscal 2010 levels. We all share the level of wanting to make offshore drilling safe, but we need to make certain that this money will be used to actually improve and resume offshore drilling. I believe we can agree that bigger government does not equate into better government. Uh, the goal should, should be to make this agency better and faster, not bigger and slower. In light of the current fiscal crisis, it's important to remember that American energy production offshore and on public lands generates billions of dollars of revenue to the government. Not only do we create jobs by producing energy, but we help lower the debt and our deficit uh, and our dependence on foreign, uh, on foreign uh, uh, countries. So uh, I just have to simply say in closing, Mr. Chairman, with my opening statement, that uh, your budget has a $60 billion uh, tax increase on American energy, and I don't believe that's the, the, what Americans need at this point, and we'd like to pursue that with you also. So with that, uh, I will uh, uh, yield back what time I don't have, and I'll recognize the uh, ranking member for his opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for uh, being here. I am struck by two facts from your testimony, Mr. Secretary. First, Interior reports that the programs and activities of the Department support more than 1.3 million jobs and $370 million in economic activity annually. Second, Interior is unique in that the Department generates more revenue for the U.S. Treasury than its annual appropriation. While our federal deficit is in the red, your department is in the black. Given these tough economic times and the enormous profits made by using public resources, I welcome your proposal that the oil and gas industry should pay a larger share of the government's costs for inspections and permits following years of lax oversight. Even I think the members in the majority uh, recognized in their spending bill uh, that more money should be diverted to robust inspections. Some have criticized the slow pace of oil and gas leasing. Of course, what the critics fail to mention is that oil production last year on federal lands was higher than in the last year of the Bush administration. And they don't disclose that oil companies uh, are not even producing on many of the leases that they currently hold. While 80 million acres are presently under lease, the oil and gas industry is only producing on about 19.5 million of those acres. Last year, the Bureau of Land Management issued 4,090 permits to drill, but operations began on only 1,480 of those permits. It's as if the oil and gas industry first asked for dessert, then ate one-fourth of their dinner, and then complained to the manager about the service. On top of that, they want to stiff you on the tip. These charges are especially absurd considering this week that the Interior Department approved a deep water drilling permit in the Gulf of Mexico. The permitted company was the first to demonstrate that it had the resources and capability to respond to an accident uh, uh, as part of their drilling request. And for those who say that this post-bill process has been political, I think the irony of BP holding the largest stake in the well for the permit you approved left everyone uh, that uh, was questioning uh, you uh, on the question of whether or not you were being political, uh, that instead you played it very straight and BP won that first lease. Mr. Secretary, I particularly appreciate your commitment to renewable energy. When you took office, there had been little effort in this area. Now you have a goal of permitting 10,000 megawatts by 2012. These efforts recognize that we can't just drill our way out of our dependence on foreign oil. We need to develop clean energy alternatives that create American jobs. The United States uses 25 percent of the world's oil, yet we have just 2% of the world's oil reserves. The world price is set 
by OPEC and increases in oil production in the United States over the last five years still cannot impact uh, the price of oil. On climate change and endangered species, there are those who prefer to deny reality and ignore the warning signs of melting polar ice, crop-killing droughts, and deadly floods. But I am glad to see that Interior attempts to deal with climate change uh, before our iconic species become but a memory. Mr. Secretary, I also welcome your proposal for full funding of the Land and Water Conservation Fund. This fund is based on the simple premise that as we deplete one resource, we should preserve other natural resources. Uh, we thank you for your leadership uh, and uh, visionary uh, stewardship of the agency. Uh, since you have been sworn in, uh, we welcome you here today. I thank the uh, ranking member and I thank his uh, very much his uh, looking at the time like I didn't, so I thank him for that. We are now ready to hear from our only witness uh, today, uh, the Honorable Ken Salazar, the Secretary of Interior. Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for being here. I would just remind you, like all witnesses, your uh, written statement will appear in the record. I would uh, like you to uh, obviously observe that five-minute time frame as much as you, uh, uh, as you possibly can. The clerk will, clerk will start the timer, and as you know, the green light goes for four minutes, yellow light for one and the red light, uh, your time is up, and if you could adhere to that, I, I would certainly appreciate that. So, Mr. Secretary, uh, thank you very, very much for being here, and you may begin. Thank you uh, very much, Chairman uh, Hastings and uh, Ranking Member Markey and uh, the distinguished members of, uh, of this committee. It's uh, an honor and a privilege to serve uh, this nation and to serve all of you as uh, the Secretary of the Interior and to be part of President Obama's cabinet. With me today, uh, is uh, David Hayes, who is the Deputy Secretary of Interior, and uh, Pam Hayes, who is the Budget Director of Interior, so that uh, they are here available to answer questions as well. Let me start by saying that the uh, mission of the Department of Interior is a mission which is extraordinarily important to each and every one of you and, and to this nation. It is a mission which uh, makes the uh, Secretary of Interior the custodian of America's uh, natural resources and the custodian of America's history. It's a mission uh, which uh, I very much enjoy working on. Uh, for those of you who are not as familiar as others with uh, the Department of the Interior, we manage 20 percent of the land mass of the United States of America, 553 national wildlife refuges and almost 400 national parks uh, throughout uh, the United States of America. We also manage uh, 1.75 billion acres of the outer continental shelf where uh, much of our oil and gas production uh, takes place and uh, have uh, important responsibilities, trust responsibilities for uh, the Native Americans uh, and their the reservations uh, in our country. Um, we are, as we see the Department of Interior, and I think uh, both the chairman and uh, the ranking member uh, got it right, where they talked about some uh, of the work that we do in terms of job production. We see our efforts at the Department of Interior as being an economic generator for our economy, and uh, certainly, uh, the numbers that we have in terms of the creation of millions of jobs from the outdoor industry as well as from energy production is something that we are very proud of. The budget that we have presented uh, to you that the President has uh, presented to the Congress for 2012 is a freeze budget. Uh, it is a budget that uh, cuts $1.1 billion, I think, in these times of uh, fiscal austerity and where uh, everyone in the country is saying that we need to be uh, fiscally tough. It's a budget that, repre that, that represents some uh, tough choices. We've cut $1.1 billion, including uh, looking at administrative savings, which uh, are important, uh, such as travel, where we're cutting $42 million from the budget, information technology, $36 million, uh, procurement uh, reform efforts that we've undertaken to make uh, government work, be work better, where we are saving $53 million. So overall, uh, cuts uh, of $1.1 billion that are accounted for in the budget that we have uh, presented in front of you. I want to briefly uh, spend some time uh, speaking about energy, both conventional and renewable, because I know that's important to the members of this committee. Uh, the conservation work, which uh, includes the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which uh, you raised in your opening statements, uh, a brief comment about water, and uh, finally a comment about youth and the efforts that we have in, in, under, underway. First, with respect to energy, uh, we recognize the role that we play at the Department of Interior in terms of powering our economy through the energy that is produced in America, and that's both conventional as well as uh, renewable energy. Our goal is simply to have a robust oil and gas program for the United States 
in both America's oceans and on America's lands. Uh, with respect to our goal in terms of having uh, that kind of program underway, we need to keep in mind the protection of people and the protection of the environment. And certainly, uh, it, uh, for some, it may seem like a distant memory. For others, it is not. And that is uh, the blow up of the Maconda well and the Deepwater Horizon uh, last year on April 20th should remind us all that that was an area where over 30 years of uh, neglect uh, resulted in uh, the kind of catastrophe that poured uh, nearly 5 million barrels of oil out into the ocean in the Gulf of Mexico. And so how we move forward with uh, safe production that protects people and the environment is of the highest order. And that's why in front of you there is a request uh, to uh, beef up significantly the funding that's available for the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and Regulation. That money will go into inspections and to improve permitting and a number of other things that will help us uh, get the job done. With respect to onshore oil and gas production, we continue to lease uh, uh, oil and gas uh, throughout uh, the United States on BLM lands and lands that we manage on behalf of the Forest Service as well. And uh, have uh, issued uh, over 5,000 permits in 2010. We'll issue about 7,000 permits in uh, 2011 and have a robust program to move forward with uh, conventional energy. On the renewable energy side, uh, to, uh, the chair to uh, Ranking Member Markey's uh, point on renewable energy, I'm proud of the fact that the Department of Interior over the last two years, over the last two years has uh, permitted over 3,700 megawatts of uh, renewable energy. Solar scale facilities in the world as well as capturing the power of the wind and geothermal and other renewable energies in uh, places, uh, Congressman Bishop in Milford, Utah, where I have been uh, on several, uh, on different occasions to look at some of the renewable energy efforts that are underway in Utah, especially there in Milford, Utah. Uh, we expect uh, in the 2012 budget that on the renewable energy front, uh, we will uh, be able to get to a level of 10,000 megawatts of power from, uh, from renewable uh, energy. Uh, on conservation, uh, just to make a few points on conservation and what is included in the budget. Uh, again, I think it's important for all of us, especially those from uh, the West, to recognize the importance of what tourism and uh, job creation occurs when we have places uh, such as my Colorado colleagues here know from Rocky Mountain National Park and so many of the other places there, or whether it's in places uh, like the Everglades where you have a, a huge number of people who actually come to our states because of the great tourism opportunities that are there. Uh, your state, uh, Chairman Hastings, is no exception to that, where uh, we see ourselves as being a huge economic generator because of the fact that people come there to hunt and fish and bike and hike and enjoy uh, the outdoors of your great state. And indeed, the Outdoor uh, Recreation uh, Industry Foundation estimates that there are six and a half million jobs that are created every year through uh, these uh, outdoor activities that occur here in our country. Mr. Chairman, I know my time is up, but uh, I would uh, respectfully request two more minutes uh, to finish my statement. Uh, go right ahead, Mr. Secretary. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so as we move forward with uh, the America's Great Outdoors Initiative, which uh, the President uh, announced, it is an effort to keep alive the conservation legacy, which uh, was started by a great Republican uh, President, Abraham Lincoln, when he, when he set aside uh, Yosemite during the middle, midst of the Civil War. <laughs> Uh, the conservation legacy of uh, Teddy Roosevelt and what he did at the beginning of, of the last century and then Franklin Roosevelt continuing that effort uh, during the most difficult times of, uh, of, of the Depression and uh, standing up the country for, for World War II. Uh, the investments that we look to make in terms of um, conservation do include uh, the Land and Water Conservation and full funding of the Land and Water Conservation Fund. When that program was created in the 1960s, it was thought that uh, the resources that would be, we would be taking from our oceans would provide a funding stream for conservation for the long term. Uh, sadly, uh, over the last uh, 50 years that has not happened and instead uh, because of the appropriations mechanisms only about half of the money should, that should have gone through conservation has actually gone through conservation. And so the ups and downs uh, really have meant that uh, the Land and Water Conservation Fund has not been fully funded. This is a historic effort on the part of the President to fund it in the context of making sure that we are standing up the economy and looking ahead at the future in the same way that uh, President uh, Teddy Roosevelt did 102, 103 years ago. Finally, uh, let me just make a quick comment about uh, water. Uh, for many of you, especially from arid states in the West, you know the importance of water. Uh, we have uh, a Water Smart program, which uh, we have started since I became Secretary of Interior uh, this last year alone in 2010. 
through the funding of 37 projects, we were able to conserve 490,000 acre feet of water, 490,000 acre feet of water through these conservation programs. Uh, when we look at uh, those of you who share the, from the seven states of the Colorado River Basin, uh, we're looking at 20% declines of water uh, in the Colorado River Basin. Uh, we're doing the same thing and looking at some declines in terms of water availability in many other parts of the country. So it's important that we continue to invest in these kinds of water conservation programs. And finally, with respect to youth and uh, the uh, opportunities that we create for uh, young people of America, and we address the jobs issues of this country, we have in the Department of Interior uh, hired about 21,000 people uh, just in, uh, 20, in uh, 2010. We hope to continue to be able to do that because these are young people who come and work in the Department of Interior, number one. They help us uh, do the work that is necessary for our mission, and number two, we provide training to young people who will become the conservation uh, leaders of our country in the future and the workers of the Department of the Interior. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, uh, I look forward to working with you, uh, with Ranking uh, Member Markey, with uh, members of this committee on uh, so many issues that are important to the United States of America. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary, and thank you for your, uh, your testimony. We will now begin the uh, questioning process, and I will recognize, recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Secretary, as we all, all we know, gasoline prices are climbing, and Americans could be paying an average of $4 per gallon very soon and maybe even higher. Back in 2008, when gas prices did reach $4 a gallon, the American people responded by asking Congress and pre the President to lift the OCS moratoria and open new areas to drilling. And that happened at the end of 2008. Since President Obama has taken office, your department and this administration has systematically, in my view, reclosed these areas to possible energy production. Onshore lease sales have been canceled in the West. No progress has been made in advancing new production in Alaska. In the Gulf of Mexico, the de facto moratorium imposed by this administration has further hindered our domestic energy production and increased our reliance on foreign oil. In fact, as part of the interim safety report issued by, by BOEM last October, the Interior Department stated, and I quote out of this uh, manual, your manual, I quote, there is sufficient spare capacity in OPEC to offset a decrease in Gulf of Mexico deep water production that could occur as a result of this rule, this rule that came from Interior, end quote. The administration is not only admitting, but seems complacent to the fact that they are deepening Americans dependent on OPEC and foreign countries for our energy. The American people understand that we cannot and should not rely on OPEC, OPEC for our energy security. The responsibility to produce America's energy resources, as you alluded to just a moment ago, rests squarely with the Department of Interior. It has the authority over America's vast energy resources Yet, America energy production, both onshore and offshore, is declining. So, Mr. Secretary, I have to ask you very pointedly, what responsibility does the President and you as Secretary of the Interior take for these rising uh, gas prices? Uh, Chairman uh, Hastings, uh, we are very well aware of uh, what's happening in the, in the world relative to rising fuel prices and, and very well aware of our responsibility here in, uh, in the United States and we're watching uh, the situation very carefully. I would respectfully, uh, Chairman Hastings, disagree with your characterization of what we have done in this administration with respect to our energy portfolio. We are strongly supportive of a comprehensive energy portfolio that does include, yes, clean energy and renewable energy, but at the same time oil and gas. And I think if you will take a frank uh, and honest look, and I would ask both Republicans and Democrats on this committee to take an honest look at what we have done over the last uh, two years, you would find the fact that we have done some things that uh, I think are moving us in the right direction where there is agreement. And let me just point out, if I may, two or three facts. Uh, since 2008, our oil and natural gas production has increased while imports of foreign oil have de decreased. It may be surprising to you, but uh, we have uh, taken our imports from 60% uh, in the 2004-2008 time period to 50% in 2010. That's a significant reduction in the importing of foreign oil. We've increased more than a third the number of barrels of oil that are being produced uh, from the outer continental shelf to 600 million barrels of oil. 
and oil production on the onshore, and I know many of you from the West are concerned about the onshore, has increased uh, 5 percent during that same, uh, that same time frame. We've expanded, uh, Chairman Hastings, um, the amount of public land and federal waters that are available for oil and gas production. Just in 2010, and I know there's criticism about what we've done in 2010, but the BLM held 29 oil and gas lease sales for public lands. And uh, as a re result of that, we have 41 million acres of public lands that are leased for oil and gas development. Uh, we've uh, done the same thing uh, with Mr. The Secretary, I only have a, a minute here, and I do want to follow up. And, and, and while those, those figures are there, and, they, they, and, and, and frankly, I think they're uh, basis for a dispute, but nevertheless, I, I, I appreciate your asking. Let me be more very, very specific then. What specific actions would the administration take if gasoline gets to 4 or $5 a gallon? What specific actions would the administration take? Well, we are looking at a number of, of different things, and there is no options uh, that have been ruled out. Uh, in terms of uh, enhancing uh, production uh, from our domestic resources, uh, we have moved forward uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, notwithstanding the fact that we had to deal with the Deepwater Horizon tragedy and have uh, permitted uh, 37 wells in the shallow waters of the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, this, uh, production in the Gulf of Mexico has remained robust throughout the last year, even after the Deepwater Horizon. And just on Monday of this week, we permitted the first of the Deepwater wells, which is a okay. very deep well, and there are more of those to come. Oh, th thank you very much. Listen, we, I just want to say in conclusion that uh, uh, we believe, I certainly believe, more production is part of the answer to that. And to the extent that uh, you are willing, the administration is willing to do that, you'll find uh, an ally with us. But I respectfully disagree, uh, and we can discuss this in the future, that that has been the action. So my time has expired, and I recognize the distinguished ranking member. I, th I thank you uh, so much. Um, the most immediate thing that can be done is to deploy the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. We have more than 700 million barrels of oil in the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. It's been used in the past. We know it's very effective, and I think uh, when we do reach that crisis point, I think it should be a weapon which we use in order to make sure that in, uh, this, uh, this uprising in the Middle East does not have a catastrophic impact on our own economy. We have this in order to protect us against those kind of um, impacts. Um, Mr. Secretary, you're requesting a budget of $12.2 billion for the coming fiscal year, uh, but you are proposing to return $14.1 billion in revenue to the United States Treasury during that same time. And you have requested legislative changes that, if enacted, would generate an additional $2.5 billion for American taxpayers. So if the Congress simply did what you have proposed in your budget, your, ag your agency would actually generate nearly four and a half billion dollars in a surplus next year that could be used to reduce the deficit. Now, one of your proposed reforms is the establishment of a fee on non-producing oil and gas leases in order to encourage energy companies to produce more oil and gas and increase the revenue collected by the federal government. Uh, today, Representative Holt and I will be introducing legislation to establish just such an escalating fee on the tens of millions of acres of public land that oil companies have under lease but on which they are not producing. Would you support congressional action to establish a fee on non-producing oil and gas leases? The answer to that is yes, uh, Congressman Markey, and it is uh, part of the, the President's budget. Uh, onshore acreage, we have 41.2 million acres of uh, land that we have leased for oil and gas production, but we only have 12.2 uh, million that is currently producing. Offshore acreage, 38 million acres that we have uh, subjected to leases, which are, actually, or which are leased. Only 6.3 million acres of those are producing. So we would be happy to work with you on uh, the specifics of the legislation, knowing that when we talk about diligence, uh, there are, it's, it's going to be important that it just not be a, uh, a, a, a direct requirement, but that we recognize that there are companies that are out there diligently attempting to develop uh, their leases, and that has to be recognized. Thank you. Uh, earlier this week, the New York Times reported that wastewater from hydraulically fractured wells in Pennsylvania and West Virginia have been sent to sewerage plants that are not able to remove the radioactive radium from it even though these levels could be as high as 2,000 times the EPA's drinking water standards. The radioactive water 
was then released into waterways at times within a mile of drinking water intake locations. Um, are you uh, examining the manner in which uh, drilling wastes uh, are being managed on federal lands and ensuring that similar problems do not exist there? Yes, and uh, Deputy Secretary David Hayes pulled together a forum on hydraulic fracking, so if I could have him answer that just for a minute. Uh, Thank ranking you, Ranking Member Markey. Yes. Uh, 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 Congressman Markey, we are working with EPA. EPA, of course, has the primary jurisdiction over water quality. They have a study under that they have underway. We are talking with the industry about the federal lands. Uh, as you know, the, the federal uh, estate in terms of uh, gas shale uh, is a small percentage of the overall resource. Uh, perhaps 15 percent, but we are looking to make sure that uh, we, uh, that the operators on public lands are not using hydraulic fracturing in a way that is uh, harmful to the environment. I, I think that's very important. I think the public really wants this to be resolved in a way in which the water which people are drinking uh, is not contaminated by those processes. Um, by the way, I want to congratulate you uh, on the announcement that you made here about uh, the 10,000 megawatts of new permitting for renewable energy resources on uh, public lands. I think that's a huge step forward, uh, built, building upon what you've already done in the past. Um, in the last administration, um, uh, there were no solar permits uh, granted on public lands and only four, four permits uh, for wind energy on public lands. I just think we have to open this thing up very broadly. It's vast expanse, as you're saying, 20 percent of the landmass of our country and just tremendous potential, uh, especially off of our coastlines uh, as well. Um, the GAO issued a report earlier this week which concluded that the American people may not be getting a fair return on federal oil and gas re uh, resources. Oil companies are drilling for free on public land in the Gulf of Mexico. What reforms are you putting in place to ensure that American taxpayers receive the billions of dollars which they are owed by the oil industry? Fifteen seconds, Mr. Secretary. We're over time here. Representative Markey, we are working very hard uh, in implementing the recommendations from the GAO. Many of those have already been uh, implemented, and uh, we actually have a study underway with uh, MBLM to understand uh, how it is that we might be able to better improve to make sure that the American taxpayer gets a fair return on the uh, property that is being leased to oil and gas companies. Good. Thank you for your service, Mr. Secretary. Time the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Duncan, is recognized well, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I first want to say that uh, I second uh, everything that you said in your opening statement, uh, especially uh, about land purchases. The uh, federal government uh, now owns or controls 30 percent of the land in this country, and state and local governments and quasi-governmental agencies own another or control another 20 percent, so you've already got half the land in some type of public ownership. And USA Today reported about three or four years ago on its front page one day that land trusts and conservancies, and there's over 2,000 of them, are purchasing land uh, equivalent to half the size of the state of New Jersey every year. We're, we're very rapidly doing away with private property in this country, making it much more expensive and harder for young families to uh, buy homes. Um, and I was, I'm concerned also about the San Joaquin Valley, even though I live in Tennessee, because I've read that uh, unemployment reached 40 percent there, and it was uh, driving up food, helping drive up food prices all across the country. And then another USA Today story last week said that gas prices were going to go to five dollars a gallon or higher. We've had, we've, we've seen some evidence of. Uh, sort of a recovery, but if we let gas prices go to 5 or $6 a gallon, it's going to really uh, stop uh, this recovery, maybe even throw us back into another recession, and it's going to hurt a lot of poor and lower income and working people. And it's been said many times we can't drill our way out of the problem, but I can tell you that if we would just start producing a little bit more, these other countries wouldn't be able to keep raising their prices as fast as they do. And I've sat on this committee for many years, and I keep hearing about Teddy Roosevelt. Well, I can tell you, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, the, governments at, the government at all levels didn't own nearly as much as high a percentage of the property as they do now, and we didn't have nearly as many people. And so it's a little bit uh, uh, ridiculous to keep talking about uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, because I, I think he would be shocked at how much government land is owned today. But, Mr. Secretary, I want to ask you this. You heard the uh, chairman say that uh, 
uh, your budget to, would uh, result in a 60 billion dollar increase uh, or tax increase on the uh, gas and oil industry D assuming or guessing that you might disagree with that uh, how uh, what figure would you put on that uh, is increased cost for the gas and oil industry because some of us are concerned that those will have to be passed on to the consumer congressman duncan uh, that number is not one that i am uh aware of. Uh, indeed, when you look at the entire budget of the Department of the Interior, that vastly exceeds the uh, number of the, of, the, of the budget. What we are proposing in the President's budget is uh, that industry pay its way in terms of uh, inspection and regulation, both offshore as well as onshore, and that is reflected in the requests that we have made with respect to the uh, Bureau of Ocean Energy uh, Management and Enforcement, if I may. I wanted just to address two of the points he raised, one on conservation. I would like for all the members of the committee to recognize that um, what we are attempting to do here is to move forward with a conservation agenda that's appropriate for the 21st century. We're not living in the days of Teddy Roosevelt, and we all recognize that. But if you look at one example where we have worked with uh, uh, Kansas and uh, the government of Kansas, but also the Kansas Livestock Association, the Kansas Farm Bureau, and so many others, to preserve the 1.1 million acres of the last remaining tall grass prairie ecosystem through a national conservation effort, which we announced about two months ago. That's an effort which will preserve the working landscapes and the ranches of uh, the Flint Hills area for generations to come. Fourth and fifth and sixth uh, generation uh, ranchers will be able to stay on those ranches. And so we are not uh, buying those uh, places for government ownership. Those are conservation areas where through easements and management programs we'll be able to manage that 1.1 million acres in a new ethos for conservation. And that's what you will see embedded in the way that we want to move forward. And I could give you lots of other examples. Well, we're, I'm about to run out of time, but I will say we're causing a problem for state and local governments that when we take so much land off of the tax rolls, at the same time the schools and the police are coming to us wanting uh, more money, and I am concerned also, as the chairman said, about the fact that we have that you keep that your department keeps telling us they have such a huge multi billion dollar maintenance backlog. And I think most of us on this side feel you should do more to take care of the property you have instead of buying additional properties. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Time of the gentleman uh, has expired. Uh, the gentleman, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Kildee. Mr. Kildee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Secretary, uh, your proposal includes uh, focusing on seven initiatives for FY 2012. And one of those uh, areas is strengthening tribal nations. This is a follow-up on President Obama's commitment to Native Americans and Alaska Natives. Can you speak a little more about the, uh, the importance of uh, this initiative? Congressman. Uh Kildy, we take the trust responsibility that we have uh, for the United States uh, in connection with the 564 tribes uh, in the United States very seriously. And fulfilling that trust responsibility means paying attention to the issues that uh, are being faced in reservations uh, around the country, including addressing uh, rampant uh, uh, violence and, and law and order issues on those reservations. So we have a robust program moving forward to uh, deal with uh, public safety on the reservations. Uh, we have a robust program moving forward to create educational opportunity for Native American children who live on those reservations through uh, the more than 130 schools that, uh, that we oversee. We are working uh, with tribes to uh, help them develop uh, their economic uh, ability, including the development of uh, their natural resources in oil and gas and renewable energy resources on tribal reservations. So many of those things um, that are priorities to the President, um, to tribal nations, and to the Department of Interior are included in this budget. I stood behind the President when he signed a, a bill to help reduce the violence uh, on the Indian lands and um, uh, saw his own sensitivity to the woman who spoke of how she had been treated violently. It was, uh, it was very touching because it came from his head, but from his heart, too. He really, he really was concerned about, about that violence, and I'm glad that uh, you and, and the President uh, are working on that and that Congress passed some good legislation on that. Uh, do you have, uh, or are you working on 
something to respond to the Carcieri decision of the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, Congressman Kildee, we are indeed, and David Hayes, who has had the lead both on Cobell as well as Carcieri, I'm going to have him quickly respond to that question. Uh, Congressman, we continue to urge the Congress to uh, pass a clean Carcieri uh, fix uh, to ensure that uh, all tribes have the right to have land in, in uh, trust. Uh, and the President's budget explicitly uh, requests that the Congress uh, act in that regard. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, the House passed legislation uh, last year, but that did not uh, clear the Senate. Was that language basically uh, in the right direction, that the language that we used last year? Yes, Congressman, and thank you for your leadership uh, in that regard. Thank you very much. And I, I, I'm encouraged by the fact that uh, uh, the Chairman uh, Doc has done a good job in trying to uh, uh, bring that to our attention again this year, but we uh, appreciate your cooperation over there. You have a special obligation to the Native Americans. Uh, I always, when I talk to Native Americans, I, especially young ones, I tell them that I, for example, and you two, and the chairman, uh, we have two types of citizenships. I'm a citizen of the sovereign state of Michigan, and I'm a citizen of the United States. But those Native Americans I speak to, I say, you have a third citizenship based upon your sovereignty. You're a citizen of the Navajo tribe, the Sault Ste. Marie tribe, and that's a very important citizenship. And we have to be careful, and I know you, under your leadership, uh, Mr. Secretary, have done a very good job to make sure we don't slice away at that sovereignty. We'll probably never come with the meat axe and try to do anything, but we have to be careful not to slice away a bit their sovereignty. And you've been very sensitive on that, and I personally appreciate it. And I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman very much for yielding back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Bishop. Secretary, thank you for coming here. This is a frequent opportunity we get to speak to you, and I appreciate your willingness to do that. I've got three quick questions for you. I'll try and go through the first two as quickly as possible to give you maximum amount of time for the third one, if that's it. First question is, is there, an, is there a line item in your proposed budget for wild lands uh, initiative? Just yes or no? We couldn't find one. No. Okay. That's smart thinking. Second one, on... Uh, the RMP process, resource management plans that were done in the state of Utah, obviously averaged between six to eight years uh, in doing so. They did the coordination mandated in FLIPMA, which was not done for the wild land policy, in which they talked to locally elected officials as well as, as, well as having public hearings. They spent two years specifically on wilderness studies for those public lands. And the decision was the 2.8 million acres in Utah that had some characteristics, 2.4 million did not have enough characteristics, but 400,000 did to be managed for their wilderness characteristics. Your wildlands proposal overturns that. So unless you want to interpret that the professionals on the ground were wrong, which I would highly doubt, or that the process, which was correct, and the analysis was done by experts, what specifically about those RMP proposals is wrong in their answer. Their answer was 400,000. What was wrong in that answer? And I want a specific and a very brief one, if you could. If, if I may, Congressman Bishop, because I know you have a major concern on the wild lands policy, and I think it's good because of Utah uh, being a, a great example to talk about this. I'm going to have David Hayes, who has spent time in Vernal, Utah, and a number of different times, as have I, Got to uh, be specific talk about for it with respect Mr. Hayes, to how it applies to Utah. Uh, the issue, Congressman, is that the, the 2.4 million acres that have wilderness characteristics in Utah, the RMP process provided no guidance whatsoever to BLM, to industry, or any party as to Mr. Hayes, let me go to the question. I'm yes. not talking about process. The process was done. Yes. What specifically about the answer was wrong? The, what was the, wrong with their answer? There is no clarity. Uh, in the RMPs about how to manage the 2.4 million acres that have wilderness characteristics. We're proposing to simply go back to that process and ask and answer that question through the RMP amendment process. So what was wrong with their decision by the professionals on the field in what you called a rush to judgment? 
the 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 inventory was excellent. It okay. identified 2.4 million acres of wilderness characteristics, and it provided no guidance to industry, to BLM folks, or anyone as to how those lands. So their answers, could be managed. the answers of 2.4 without enough characteristics, that was accurate. Uh, we think the inventory was good, was so well that, done. The 2.4 was the accurate answer. The, the problem is that there was no guidance in the RMP so for still how looking, those lands should be managed. We're still only looking at 400,000 that have potentially be guided as wilderness, managed as wilderness. You're not changing that. No, that's good. Well, right, fine. That's, then there's no need for going through the process. Let me then go to the real one. No, no, Mr. I Secretary. think. Secretary. Thank you. You answered it. Let me try the real one, Mr. Secretary. What? You've received a great deal of congratulations for, for the management style of the Department of Interior, often by people who don't, aren't really impacted by it. I mean, the ranking member is a great person, but to be honest, he has to go on a road trip to find BLM land close to his, his, his uh, hometown. We have others that really still think of the West as their personal playground or as a nice backdrop for John Wayne movies. Mr. Grijalva once jokingly said that he wished his state had as much public land as my state. I agreed with him, but for different reasons. So it is true of all the public land that is owned and managed by the Department of Interior. 93% is found west of Denver, correct? I'm not sure of the number, but in general. I'm close. 4% is found east of Denver. So the question I have to have, sir, especially after the Swine Lands proposal, which has no statutory requirement to do it, nor, as we found out two days ago in our hearing, has a statutory authority to do so, then here's the question. These are, the, these are the letters from the locally, affected, locally elected officials in our state. Why is the overwhelming majority of locally elected officials, why is the overwhelming majority of elected governors in, those, in the western states, which has 93%, and I'm, I have to tell you, the elected officials who are in Congress are not that crazy too, why are they opposed to what you are trying to do? Why, is, why are the people directly impacted by these decisions are the ones who are complaining time and time again about your decisions? That's why I wanted to give you enough time to do that one. Well, with 19 seconds uh, left, let me just say, Congressman Bishop, that I uh, think there is a, a misunderstanding on your part and the part of many others with respect to the wildlands policy. And so we will uh, communicate uh, with the citizens of Utah as well as with others about the specific uh, consequence of uh, the BLM uh, wildlands policy. Mr. Secretary, that's a perfect say, thing to say, I, and I appreciate you doing it. I just wish finish. you'd done it before me, you made the, for, the announcement. Let me, let me finish. First, it is uh, very important for you to recognize that this is a requirement of the law. And in fact, uh, the Circuit Court of Appeals have recognized that this is a mandamus responsibility that we have in the Department of the Interior. Second of all, there's not, and uh, there is no acre that has been made or designated as wildlands, and we recognize the wilderness designation is ultimately an authority of the Congress. And thirdly, that as we move forward with uh, the RMP process and uh, uh, moving forward yeah, with Mr. how we Secretary. manage public lands, we will seek the local input of people to provide us guidance yeah. on how we move forward. Mr. Secretary and, and, and uh, my friend from Utah, we're going to have more hearings on this, as was alluded to when we had a hearing earlier. We will we will pursue this, but thank you very much. Next, I'd rec recognize my uh, my colleague from uh, Oregon, Mr. DeFazio. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for being here, Mr. Secretary. I, I guess I'd strike a little different tone and, and say that uh, you know, in my state, uh, particularly with the problem that has been uh, prevalent for more than 20 years through uh, both uh, starting with the first Bush administration, the Clinton administration, the Bush administration, and then extending into uh, your tenure, uh, we have been uh, deadlocked on the management of some unique forest lands, the ONC lands uh, in Oregon. Uh, and I want to thank you for the individual attention uh, that you've put into uh, trying to help break that deadlock, and I want to encourage you and your department and Mr. Hayes and others who are knowledgeable in working on this uh, to continue to move forward uh, thoughtfully on these uh, pilot projects where we can look at uh, getting into our forests again, uh, making them more healthy and removing a viable uh, commercial product uh, where appropriate. And I, I just really want to thank you for that. I know it's tough budgetary times. Uh, but, but if we break this gridlock, there will be revenue for the government, revenue for my counties, there will be jobs, we will have healthier forests, and I think these pilot projects for the first time in four administrations hold some promise of 
giving us a path forward. So I just, I wanted to set a little different tone and because there's others who, you know, get uh, different concerns and, and uh, that they want to raise with you. So thank you and I, you don't really need to respond to that. Uh, you're doing a great job. Um, I would like to go back to something the chairman raised about land and water conservation funds. Now, my understanding is that uh, there are no general fund dollars in the land and water conservation fund. Is that correct? These are dedicated revenue sources uh, that are channeled into LWCF. That's correct. Yeah. So, um, and right now under law, uh, those are required to be spent in a very limited way in terms of uh, the acquisition of, of land to mitigate for other impacts elsewhere, or depletion of resources elsewhere, or things that are desirable in terms of, uh, you know, communities and federal uh, uh, priorities. Is that correct? I mean, it, it is correct. There is a, the Land and Water Conservation Fund statute when it was written back in the 1960s uh, provided guidance to where that money should go. But it ultimately, when you look at the United States of America, there have been land and water conservation projects uh, in every single state of America. And what I would say about that as well is that um, I think it is a kind of uh, incentivization that has uh, brought about much of the conservation legacy that we have today here in this country. And I think, as you well know, uh, Congressman DeFazio, uh, you know, it, it is a broken promise. Uh, Stuart Udall and Robert Kennedy, Henry Diamond, others who worked on that back in the 1960s really felt that it would be fully funded. And yet, uh, 50 years and uh, it has never been fully funded because although the money is credited in the Treasury to go into the Land and Water Conservation Fund, uh, only about half of the money has ever gone into Land and Water Conservation Fund. The rest has never reached the goal. Right, it's used as a phony deficit offset since the money can't legally be spent on general fund government activities, but we make, we off, we on the books say, oh, well, gee, there's $450 million less deficit because we didn't spend those on the, the, what's legally authorized. I'm, I'm not familiar with, and I don't know if the department keeps, but I know in my state uh, we have a backlog of projects with willing sellers uh, and community support, often uh, county commissioners, city uh, councils and others uh, hoping uh, for land water conservation acquisitions. Is there any sort of a national list that you maintain? Because uh, I, I imagine that most members here aren't aware that they have communities or projects in their districts or their states where there is tremendous support, where we just haven't made the money available because we're using it as a phony offset to make the deficit look smaller. The, the answer to that is that these projects exist uh, in every one of the states of the country and uh, they're local and, and state projects as well as uh, some projects uh, from our agencies. The National Park Service uh, alone uh, has, has about $2 billion in terms of acquisitions and some of them are expensive. Grand Teton, they're in holdings in the Grand Teton where we worked with uh, uh, the state of Wyoming to try to figure out how we could buy out some of those in holdings uh, to preserve uh, the Grand Tetons uh, for the future. Uh, but the needs are huge. They're in the they're in the multi billions of dollars. So we could productively, with community and state support and tremendous consensus, uh, spend these funds for their lawfully authorized purpose if we stopped uh, using them as a phony budget offset. And that's what you're proposing this year. In, indeed, and I would offer this too. If you want to put it into a historical context, uh, in 1999, uh, the House of Representatives actually passed what would have been a 3.2 billion dollar package that essentially would have funded most of the components of Land and Water Conservation Fund. And so coming in and looking at a $900 million request, which is the current authorized level, uh, I think, uh, in my view, is a, uh, is a humble and modest request given the need that is out there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Time the gentleman has expired. The uh, chair recognizes the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Lamborn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for being here today, Mr. Salazar. Uh, Mr. Secretary, as you know, a number of environmental groups in Colorado and elsewhere have pressured you to cancel oil and gas leases that were signed and issued to the successful high bidders following BLM public auctions. You were asked about this issue during an interview you gave with the editorial board of the Grand Junction Daily Sentinel in August of 2009. You were quoted as saying that you would not withdraw, could, could not withdraw the Lone Plateau leases in Colorado because once these leases were signed, they provided the buyers with a property right that you and your agency were bound to protect. Since I have a short period of time, I would appreciate it if you could answer the following few questions with a yes or no. 
Uh, do you still stand by this statement that you made to the Grand Junctional Daily Sentinel in 2009? We, um, that, that statement was accurate then. It would be accurate today if those issues have, if those leases um, uh, were in fact issued and, and, and signed. Okay. The, 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 there, there is litigation on the Rome Plateau, uh, Congressman Lamborn, and uh, efforts to try to create a, a program okay. forward that will allow the development of oil and gas on the Rome Plateau, okay. but to do it with the best practices available from the oil and gas industry and those who have been part of negotiations that have been underway. Okay, and then as Secretary of Interior, do you and your agency, and I'm assuming the answer is yes, but just so to verify, that you intend to protect the private property rights of companies that are holding federal oil and gas leases that have been signed and issued? The answer is we will protect private property rights and follow the law okay. in terms of what okay. the law requires us to do. And, and are you aware that the Mineral Leasing Act requires the BLM to issue oil and gas leases within 60 days following payment by the successful high bidder of the remainder of the bonus bid, if any is owed, and the first year's annual rental? Yeah, I, I believe that there, there is language in um, the statutes that, uh, that, that make those requirements, but I will also tell you, uh, uh, Congressman Lamborn, that uh, most of the leases that have been issued, frankly, have been protested and gone into litigation, which essentially is what has caused, if you will, the, the uh, backlog of much of the activity. And much of it happened because of the rush to judgment to lease everything everywhere without approaching it in the way that we are okay. approaching it, which is to be smart yeah. from the start. And once you're into litigation, you can you can point the specific statute out to me uh, okay, Doug, okay. as many yeah. times as you can, but you're not going to get a lease, essentially, that's going to get into production. And I understand the courts litigation. may interfere, as you point out, and tell you to do something. Yeah, I'm talking about activity by your department separate from whatever a court might say pursuant to litigation. So here's what I'm concluding with. A local forest supervisor in Wyoming recently signed a record of decision in which she decided that the government should cancel oil and gas leases that have already been issued. Now, since BLM leases, uh, leases out federal oil and gas resources underlying national forests, how and when do you intend to notify the Forest Service that the Department of Interior cannot and will not cancel federal oil and gas leases that have been issued for Forest Service parcels. Congressman Lamborn will, will follow the law, but I think the results uh, speak for themselves. I think in 2010, the fact that we issued 5,200 uh, leases in 2010, that we project that in 2011 we'll issue 7,200 leases in the onshore, the fact that we have 41 million acres that have already been leased out to oil and gas development, I think that those statistics speak for themselves. Uh, those are good statistics, but in this instance, uh, we see a possibility that according to what one local forest supervisor in Wyoming would like to do, uh, the result would be a, the cancellation of existing leases that have been issued. They, you told the Grand Junction Sentinel that in another case, in the Rhone Plateau case, that would be a violation of private property rights. Well, wouldn't that also apply here? Uh, Congressman Lamborn, uh, I'd be happy to take a look at the specific case that you are referencing here and uh, get back to you on the specifics. I don't have the information in front of me with respect to the specific case you speak about. D do you agree that that would be a violation of, of uh, apart from whatever a court might say, that that's a violation of private property rights? I don't know. I, I will look into the case that you raise if you get that information to my staff and we'll get back to you with the specifics of the particular case. I'm not going to speculate based on this conversation and, and your questions here. Okay, thank you. Time of the gentleman has expired. Uh, I, would, I would ask too, if Mr. Secretary, because I know this will come up, other members will have questions and if you could respond in a very timely manner to those questions, uh, that would be very, very helpful uh, to us and uh, I know that request has been made of you in the past. Chair recognizes the gentleman from American Samoa, Mr. Falio Mavega. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to offer my personal congratulations uh, for your attainment of the chairmanship, uh, Mr. Chairman, and also our ranking member from the committee. 
Welcome to the committee, Mr. Secretary. As the President's point man to care for our country's natural resources, I do want to commend you for your leadership and services to our nation. Mr. Secretary, on the eve of the current crisis in the Middle East, especially with oil producing countries like Libya, and I believe the Chairman has touched on this issue, the fear among the American consumers that the, gas of, of, the price of gas may be going up as high as $5 a gallon by this summer. Is the administration currently making contingency plans in anticipation uh, of something as critical as this in terms of lessening the price of gas in the coming months? Uh, Congressman, uh, everything is on the table and everything is being looked at uh, in terms of uh, potential actions. Uh, the, the President has made it clear and mem many members of Congress have made it clear that obviously uh, working on the economy and standing this economy up is uh, of highest priority for the American people and uh, obviously the price of, of, of fuel uh, is one of those factors and so every option will be looked at. Mr. Secretary, you perhaps more than anyone in the administration has had a more in-depth understanding of the oil spill caused by the British Petroleum Company. Can I ask, what was the total damage as a result of this oil spill? Because it's been months now, I don't know what the bottom line is and the cause of the oil spill. What is the total damage that was caused by the oil spill by British Petroleum, may I ask? Uh, Congressman, uh, the, those issues are still being evaluated. Uh, there is a natural resource damage assessment program which is uh, underway, which involves uh, the five states of the Gulf Coast and uh, the Department of Interior and the Department of Commerce and the Department of Justice. Uh, there are other issues that we're looking at, uh, but it will be some time before uh, there is uh, a more exact calculation of the uh, total amount of damage that was caused from the BP oil spill. All right. Now, how is it that a foreign company like British Petroleum uh, and I don't know if the media reports have been accurate of this. Uh, British Petroleum was found in violation of so many of the regulatory <laughs> uh, regulations. Uh, and yet, ironically, uh, most of all our Ameri major American oil companies were in compliance uh, with the oil spill you know, standards. How is it that a foreign company like, uh, like uh, British Petroleum got away with all this? My own uh, view of that, Congressman, is that um there was a complacency that included the United States Congress, uh, Republican and Democratic presidents, and uh, secretaries of interior for a long time. And the consequence of that was uh, a uh, lack of um, keeping up with the technology that was going into the deeper and deeper waters in the Gulf. And uh, the consequence of that today, and the responsibility and duty which I believe we all share, both as an administration and as a Congress, is to make sure that if our policy of the United States is to promote oil and gas development in the Outer Continental Shelf, which is a policy of this President, and uh, I am implementing that in the Department of Interior, that we do it in a safe way that protects the environment and uh, protects the people. And that is why the budget that is in front of you that uh, would fund the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and Regulation is such an important component of our energy future for the country. In your opinion, has British Petroleum properly compensated the many small businesses, the people that were affected negatively by the oil spill? You know that, uh, Congressman, that process is uh, underway, and uh, there's a claims process which is uh, being executed, and uh, it's still far from uh, being uh, complete. I do want to commend my good friend from Michigan, uh, as well as members of our Native American Congressional Caucus for your successful negotiations, not only the Cobell issue, as well as the carcer area. We're going to continue following this. And uh, I think my time is about up, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, thank the uh, gentleman that uh, had, had some time to yield back, and I, pre I appreciate that. Uh, the gentleman from uh, Virginia, Mr. Whitman, is recognized for five minutes. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Salazar, Secretary Salazar, for joining us today. We appreciate uh, this opportunity. I want to begin by letting you know my concerns about the FY12 budget as it relates to domestic energy production. I think we need to do more there. I appreciate the efforts that are being put forth to promote wind energy in the Mid-Atlantic. I think that's a critical part of this. But I also want to offer that I hope that you re-examine the cancellation of leases off of Virginia 
for oil and gas. I think those those are critical. I know Virginia stands ready, willing, and able to to assist in making sure that we do all we can to get that energy production going off of our coast. I want to talk a little bit about the Chesapeake Bay executive order. As you know, the president signed that uh, last year, and that is a, an effort to restore habitat within the Chesapeake Bay. And I wanted to ask a couple of questions there. One is, is where is uh, the Department of Interior currently in that implementing that particular executive order, and can you talk about the critical programs in your FY12 budget recommendation that, uh, that would enhance the implementation of the President's executive order? And I want to piggyback a little bit on that, talking about the North American Wetlands Conservation Act funding. As you know, that's, uh, that's also a critical element of preserving habitat for migratory bird populations, and that does have a specific economic impact. Uh, those wildlife-related in those areas generates about $120 billion a year and about 4,000 jobs, many of those in rural areas. And in, and in my district and throughout the state of Virginia, those are, those are critical elements of what we are dealing with. And as an avid waterfowl hunter and a member of the Migratory Bird Conservation Commission, we all know how important those dollars are. And I wanted to get you to comment about why these North American Wetlands Conservation Act funding dollars are important and how is the funding there at that level leveraged with private dollars in order to set some of these lands aside and preserve these critical habitats, both through purchase but also uh, more predominantly these days with, with conservation e easement per uh, purchases? Congressman uh, Wimmer, let me first uh, thank you for your service on the, the commission along with uh, Senator Thad Cochran and uh, now Senator Pryor and uh, uh, others who serve on that commission from the states as well as uh, the Department of Interior. And let me say first on the Chesapeake Bay, uh, there is uh, a significant amount of money, I think $33.6 million that is proposed in the President's budget for the Chesapeake. Uh, we do view as an administration uh, the Chesapeake Bay as being uh, one of those landscapes of national significance for the country. We know there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. Uh, the National Park Service and uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service are working closely with uh, Virginia and with local communities to try to identify how we can be helpful in terms of uh, the restoration of the Chesapeake. It will remain a high priority for us. And uh, finally, what I would just say to you, I think in terms of uh, the NACWA funding, I think it is a great example of the kind of conservation effort that uh, we need to embark upon. And it's uh, what underlies the America's Great Outdoors and underpins the Land and Water Conservation Fund. And, you sitting with me in those committees uh, often over the last two years have seen how much it is that we're able to leverage uh, for wetlands, uh, which are totally supported by the hunters and anglers of America and conservationists, because there is a shortage of money. And so when we're able to put out a little bit of money through the NACA funding, we're able to triple or quadruple the amount of money that comes in from Ducks Unlimited and Trout Unlimited and state governments and so many others to really do a lot for conservation. So I think it's a good template. Thank you. I think that's a great example of how we can take that, um, that source of income there and, as you said, leverage it in some, in some pretty powerful ways and with partners who not only by themselves uh, promote those efforts but in conjunction with the government are out there making sure that we're preserving those, those critical habitats. Let me ask a little bit about the Land and Water Conser Conservation Fund. Uh, the FY12 budget uh, request um, obviously enhances some of that, but I wanted to get your, your get your thoughts on on how those efforts are going to provide continued uh, outdoor recreational activity access uh, to folks, and specifically in districts like mine, where where those those activities are are a critical part of the economies of of many areas here in the United States. I just want to get your get your thoughts about how those dollars are are there to promote and to enhance those activities. You know, Congressman Women, what we will do is to work uh, very closely, obviously, with the states and with local governments and um, non-governmental organizations to identify those places that uh, are the economic uh, generators of our communities in terms of outdoor recreations, whether those are uh, urban parks and uh, communities in, in Virginia or whether it's uh, the protection and restoration of wetlands, uh, which are important for hunters and, and, and for anglers. Uh, but that's where that money would go. The, the amount really that is needed for doing what would be an appropriate job for uh, Land and Water Conservation Fund is uh, in the billions of dollars. And indeed, uh, I think some estimates are somewhere between five and ten billion dollars. And so the amount that we have requested here, and 900 million, which is essentially what is authorized under the law, 
I think is a good investment uh, relative to moving uh, the economics around. As I said earlier, when we think about it, it is uh, you know, six and a half million jobs that are just created uh, through the outdoor recreational activities, and this is according to the Outdoor Recreation Foundation. The time of the gentleman has expired. Uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Costa. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for the, the good job that you're doing on a host of issues. And um, uh, you see me and, and, of course, you see water in California, and, and obviously that's where I'm going to focus my comments and questions. The Bay Delta Conservation Plan and the efforts that you folks are, 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 are putting together are critical. If it's going to have any success and if the locals are going to continue to support it and participate financially and the state, the consolidation and the efforts and the federal participation is critical. Uh, and there has to be an end to the process. We have been processed to death. In, in, on, on these issues for over a decade. And so I want to reiterate and, and, and get your quick response to the commitment on that Bay Delta Conservation Plan. Uh, Congressman Casa, let me commit to you that we'll continue to focus like a laser beam on uh, the issues in the, in the California Bay Delta. We appreciate your leadership uh, and that of uh, Congresswoman Napolitano and so many others who have helped on that, on that effort. I want David uh, Hayes, because he is leading this effort on the BDCP, to quickly give you a quick update on what we are doing on the Bay Delta Conservation Plan. Quickly, because I want to get back to the San Joaquin River and water allocations this year. Quickly, David. I'll be very quick, uh, Congressman. We're working very closely with the new administration uh, in California. Uh, this is a state-driven uh, process. Uh, we, we are full partners with the uh, new Resources Secretary John Laird and Jerry Merrill, who's in charge of this for the, for the governor, and we'll look forward to working with you and other members of the California delegation as we move forward. Mr. Secretary, I provided you a letter on February 18th and, uh, and actually hand-delivered it as well when I saw you in the Valley last week. Thank you again for your participation at that historic uh, dedication. Um, but in the letter, we talked about uh, a number of issues uh, with regards to interim projects. Uh, you give credit where credit's due. Uh, we had difficulty two years ago on getting administrative flexibility in the operation of the the, the project south of the Delta. Last year, you came forward and, and did so. As a result, we, we got a 50% water allocation. We got $54 million in local projects. We got the construction of the Intertie project that had been delayed for almost two decades. It's under construction. It will mean 35,000 acre feet of additional yield. So I want to credit you on those points. But today, we have a situation where a number of districts um, are at 100% of their allocation. Uh, and uh, we're, I commend that we did an early announcement at 50 percent, but we've continued to get rain this week and more snow in the mountains, and it just seems to me before the new uh, reductions kick in on April 1st and May that could provide additional allocation above 50 percent on the San Luis unit that, that we need to take action. Is the, uh, Mr. Connor said yesterday he's working on that. Is the issue within the Department of Interior or Department of Commerce with NOAA as it relates to that specific flexibility? Let me uh, see if David knows the answer to that question. I would just say to you that we have uh, spent a huge amount of our time working on a number of the projects that you spoke about and also dealing with improving how we are projecting uh, the water availability to the agricultural community and ice. And that's important. You're as a farmer, no, you make plans in February and March and you talk to your bankers and if you, you we're talking about May and June, forget about it because it's, and, and that it's not going to do any good. As a direct result of that in our conversations of last year, that's why we have the kind of, uh, I hope, a better timeliness relative to giving farmers that kind of direction on the specific question. David, do you have the answer to the congressman? Uh, yes, Congressman. Uh, last week, as you as you know, uh, we had a collaborative settlement of the litigation surrounding the uh, operation of the system for the balance of this year. The water users came together with the environmental groups, with the state, and with with us, and together we we uh, agreed on the, how to operate to maximize how much water can be available through the next uh, few months, uh, and that together with the 
with uh, the wet winter uh, puts us in a, an extraordinarily good position in California. And also that settlement, I think, demonstrated that everyone is working together here to reach a long-term solution, which of course is what the Bay Delta Conservation Plan right. is Quickly, is all before about. my time's up, there have been damages uh, on third-party agreements on the San Joaquin River Settlement Agreement. Uh, what efforts are you going to make to uh, respond to those damages by third parties? I know you're familiar with it, and also the timelines on the restoration. They're important, but, you know, Mr. Garamendi and I have discussed there are problems on channel clearing and all sorts of stuff that needs to be done, has to be paid for, and uh, before we can even begin to talk about reintroduction of salmon on 2013, that timeline. My time's expired, but I don't know, Mr. Chairman, if you'll allow him to answer the question. Uh, I would prefer uh, to try to keep this going, but Mr. Uh, Mr. Secretary, if you'd respond to Mr. Costa in writing, I think that, and Mr. Hayes, that would be very, very beneficial. But thank you for your consideration. Chair, recognize the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Kaufman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Secretary. Welcome to the committee, uh, and thanks for your service to our country. I, um, uh, you know, I'm I'm very concerned about the the overall economy. And uh, having spent, um, having had four military overseas assignments in my career, four of which took me to the Middle East, um, I understand the instability there and its, it's uh, resulting impact potentially on oil prices and that unfortunately we're still reliant a lot on imported oil. And that my concern is in this fragile recovery that we have right now, that a prolonged spike in oil prices will set this country back and will cause a double dip recession. And, and I think that uh, families uh, in our home state and across the country are already feeling the effects uh, of rising prices at the pump right now. And uh, I mean, if, if prices uh, go north of $4 uh, uh, in Colorado, go north of $5, uh, that's not simply gonna hurt families directly, but it's gonna raise the transportation cost uh, that's going to impact uh, all of the goods that they buy from groceries to everything else. And so I'm very concerned that we're, we're really caught, going to be caught flat on our feet on these issues. And everything you talk about today is going to oil and natural gas uh, in the United States to the consumers. And so, uh, and I understand that, you know, you have uh, uh, this new energy frontier that you're working on and that where you say that um, the department's new energy frontier initiative to create jobs, reduce the nation's dependence on fossil fuels and oil imports and reduce carbon impacts, facilitating renewable energy development is a major component of this strategy along with effective management of conventional energy programs. And so um, more solar projects, more wind projects, um, that's electrical generation and that doesn't impact uh, really our foreign uh, imports because those are primarily used as transportation fuels and manufacturing processes. And so, uh, you know, I'm sure that the truth lies somewhere in the middle. But from what you're saying and what folks like the Western Energy Alliance are saying, the producers of oil and gas are two very different things. And they seem to suggest that you're uh, throwing up every bureaucratic obstacle that you can find uh, to develop oil and gas in the United States. I, that's certainly their view. I think that um, they say uh, a number of things. Uh, uh, in terms of the decline of oil and gas production uh, on public lands, onshore, uh, in the United States. And um, so one question I have, you also talked about you're going to increase fees on uh, oil and gas development in order to pay for the regulatory burdens that they impose. Um, and you talk in your statement, you mention that the department has made okay, significant advances in its priority goal to increase approved uh, capacity for renewable energy production on interior lands by at least 10,000 megawatts uh, by the end of 2012 while ensuring full environmental review. And then you go on and talk about 
you know, how you're going to increase that production. Um, I guess one question I have for you, uh, and let me tell you, I'm an all of the above uh, uh, person when it comes to energy strategy for this country. But are you going to require on the renewable side that they also pay the regulatory cost of the burdens that they impose as you do on the oil and gas side? The Congressman Kaufman, the basic principle that we have is uh, that we want a fair return to the American taxpayer, and so that's what we will do with uh, solar and uh, other renewable energy projects as well. I appreciate the fact that you are uh, supportive of uh, uh, an all of the above uh, kind of energy program, and I appreciate your service to our country. Our, our own uh, view of this, uh, the President's view and, and my view, is uh, we need to have a robust uh, domestic production. Uh, we also need to embrace uh, alternative energy, including uh, nuclear and uh, clean coal and uh, solar and wind and geothermal. And we also need to embrace efficiency. And indeed, uh, some of the efficiency measures that we now have with the higher CAFE standards are saving a significant amount of energy that we're importing into this country. And so I think there is, frankly, in this area of energy and the energy future for America, a place where there may be an opportunity to find common ground uh, between uh, the Republican majority in the House of Representatives and, uh, and the administration. The time of the gentleman has expired. Uh, gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Holtz, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, I'm sure some days it doesn't seem that you have uh, uh, such an exhilarating job, but you have a, a wonderful opportunity to show the uh, common ground between uh, a vibrant economy and uh, environmental protection. And uh, I, th I thank you for how you're doing it. Um, earlier this week, as Mr. Markey pointed out, uh, the New York Times had a series of articles about uh, gas drilling. And they reported that in 2009, Wyoming failed to meet air quality standards for the first time in history, and that one county in Wyoming with a population of less than 10,000 people but with one of the highest concentrations of drilling wells, experienced ozone levels that were higher than those found in Houston or Los Angeles. Now, as part of the uh, environmental assessment and permitting process, does the Department of the Interior require monitoring or limitations on emissions from drilling activities on federal lands? Uh, the answer to that is, uh is yes, and uh, we're aware of some of the challenges that so, we face. So you do require monitoring, and you do require on limitations ozone. on those emissions? On emissions, yes. Okay. Um, do you have sufficient statutory authority uh, to do what you think needs to be done? Let me have uh, David Hayes uh, answer uh, part of the question. Okay. Uh, Congressman, you're, you're pointing out a very serious and important uh, issue that is uh, affecting uh, a lot of folks, uh, the air quality in, in some areas in Utah, Colorado, and the Four Corners area generally. We're working with EPA uh, to address uh, monitoring needs in the area. Uh, BLM also has underway a, uh, an examination of fugitive emissions uh, to help reduce those emissions. Uh, we think we have the current authority required uh, to help tighten up uh, fugitive em emissions and to reduce uh, ozone-forming uh, releases. I, I hope you'll report to me uh, in more detail in writing of kind of what you are doing uh, in those areas. Um, there's been a lot of talk in the past year about uh, standards for uh, safety for offshore um, drilling. Uh, has the department revised its onshore regulations to make sure that the best practices are being observed. There are some new techniques, uh, in particular hydraulic fracturing, uh, that are rapidly uh, gaining uh, prevalence uh, in the industry. Uh, has the DOE, has the DOI in, uh, revised the, the regulations uh, for uh, best practice? We've had uh, a number of revisions to regulations trying to move forward with uh a, an onshore domestic uh, production program uh, that is uh, efficient. We are looking at ways in uh, which uh, we can improve that beyond uh, where we are today, and we know that there are companies out there that are very involved in best practices kinds of programs, including in hydraulic fracturing. We had a uh, conference. When, when were the regulations last updated? 
Well, it depends on which specific regulations you are speaking about. Well, when were any new regulations promulgated for onshore uh, gas extraction? The uh, we have ha we have had a number of uh, regulations that we have issued, including uh, some this this year with res with respect to uh, uh, resource uh, manage master leasing programs for oil and gas so that we can have a better way and a more uh, understandable way of how we're going about uh, our leasing programs uh, in the onshore, and those rules okay. were promulgated well, within the last year. Uh, thanks. I'll look forward for, to a, a fuller discussion of that also, uh, because it's a rapidly developing field, and, and companies, producers are learning a lot. And uh, I think we want to make sure that that's reflected in uh, uh, in, in any of the regulations that the gov government promulgates. Um, I think uh, with the limited time, I will uh, skip my, my next question, but I just wanted to express my uh, interest in your pursuing the idea of, of um, uh, uh, acquiring ongoing royalties for uh, land for licensed areas that are not used in production. Uh, we've talked about that earlier this morning with Mr. Markey. I think it's uh, only fair to taxpayers. Uh, it is not an undue burden on the producers, and I think it's something we really should move forward with. Thank you. Time of the gentleman has expired. The uh, gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Fleming, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, I represent the 4th District of Louisiana. Uh, I want to lay the foundation for my question here, and it revolves around the Deep Horizon incident. First, we had the spill, then we had a moratorium, uh, despite the fact that the President's uh, hand-picked counsel recommended against it. Then we had a de facto moratorium, uh, and then we had a contempt of court uh, as a result of that, and I, I do want to quote the judge, Judge Feldman, on that. He says, the government continually reaffirmed its intention and resolve to restore the moratorium. It even notified operators that though a preliminary injunction had issued, they could quickly expect a new moratorium. He went on to say that there was clear and convincing evidence of the government's contempt of this court's preliminary injunction. And it's kind of interesting because I know a lot of times, uh, and you've testified before us before, that you use uh, following the law and court orders as a defense of your position, but it appears to me, and I'll let you respond in a minute, that there's often uh, selective enforcement. Finally, after uh, the contempt was issued, we got one token permit. Now here's what the results have been so far. Loss of 20% of our deep water rigs. Uh, we've stacked, we've got 33 shallow water rigs that are stacked which was not even part of the incident to begin with. Uh, Seahawk Drilling, a major player, has now filed bankruptcy. And we have thousands of good jobs now uh, of, of very fine Louisiana citizens that have been lost. Uh, but the impact is worse than that. In a time when we're not doing anything in Anwar, a time when hydrofracking is under attack, uh, We've got an estimate from the American Petroleum Institute that as much as 680,000 barrels of oil equivalent Gulf production a day could be at risk in 2019. That is to say, if we don't get back to drilling uh, in the deep water, we're going to uh, find ourselves by 2019 the equivalent of 12 percent of the total U.S. current production being lost. Uh, so the impact is very significant. And we well can't really, uh, in a time of a terrible economy and gas prices going up very quickly, uh, we well cannot really, uh, I think, uh, afford this. And then finally, those six rigs that uh, have left the area now, they've gone to countries like Brazil and Egypt, where the regulations and the oversight are much less than they are here. So my question is this, considering all of those points, uh, isn't this really an overall policy by the administration uh, to allow gas prices to go up, to allow energy prices, fossil fuels to go up by constricting fossil fuel production in order to allow uh, alternative fuels 
which are not really cutting it in the marketplace, to allow those prices to come in parity and become uh, more competitive. And we have had, uh, in fact, some uh, testimony to suggest that. And in fact, uh, Stephen Chu, Obama's Energy Secretary, said that a gradual increase in gasoline taxes could coax customers into dumping their gas guzzlers and finding homes closer to where they work, suggesting that th it could be actually a positive thing to see gas prices go up. So is this, sir, a really attempt in order to drive the prices up so alternative fuels will, will be more competitive? Congressman uh, Fleming, with all due respect, uh, I disagree with uh, your characterization and your foundation. And the fact of the matter is that uh, we have moved forward with uh, drilling both onshore and offshore. We have issued 37 uh, shallow water permits. Uh, indeed, your number, numbers are wrong relative to what's happening with uh, rig activity in the Gulf of Mexico. In 2009, there were 116 rigs in the Gulf of Mexico. In 2010, February, 120. In February 2011, it's 126. You, ask the, you should ask the question, why is the number of rigs going up in the Gulf of Mexico? And the fact of the matter is that people are aware, we are aware at the Department of Interior, this Congress is aware, that there is significant oil and gas resources within the Gulf of Mexico. And it's a policy of this administration to uh, explore and to develop uh, that oil and gas as we have been doing over the last several years. Well, of course, we can, we can quibble over the numbers, but the point is, at least from what we're seeing there, uh, perhaps there are other things that organically were, in, uh, were increasing underneath, but we're definitely seeing, at least off the coast of Louisiana, a substantial decrease in new rig activity and without any real justification. With that, I yield back. Sir. The, the, the time the gentleman the has statistics, uh, Mr. Congressman, are uh, absolutely wrong. I mean, when you look at the production within the Gulf of Mexico, even in the midst of the national crisis of the Deepwater Horizon, the production has remained uh, at an all-time uh, high, and uh, we expect that it will continue uh, as we bring new production online. This will clearly be a matter that will be pursued, uh, I am sure. The gentleman from Northern Mariana is Mr. Sublan, is recognized for five minutes. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Secretary Salinger, for your service to the country and for the attention that you and um, your department, and especially the uh, Office of Insular Affairs, the attention they give to the territories, and in particular the Northern Mariana Islands. Um, we had a hearing yesterday, and so uh, there are issues that I brought up there that we'll continue to pursue. Uh, I do have, I would like for you to know also, M Mr. Secretary, that I, I do have some very serious concerns with the President's proposal, including a language that uh, the CIP money, which is under the title Covenant 702 CIP money, which started 100% for the Northern Marian Islands uh, in the past 33 years, um, because we had no representation here, kept getting shaved away, where now two-thirds doesn't come to the Northern Mariana Islands. Now there's a language there that proposes that could eventually erase it entirely for the Northern Mariana Islands. I will be working with the Assistant Secretary on, on trying to fix that uh, situation, but I, I, I think I object to that. Uh, um, having said that also, um, Mr. Secretary, um, as you know, um, I come from a District 14 Islands, and uh, with gasoline is approaching $5 a gallon, Electricity is over 40 cents a kilowatt hour. People make the lowest minimum wage in the country. And uh, from a territory whose GDP is, has decreased by uh, f over 4% in, in the last uh, uh, report that came out, uh, I'm concerned, sir, that, um, that uh, the president's budget is requesting for a decrease in, in, in assistance, uh, money for assistance to the territories. Uh, and uh, or that some of the money is being provided is going to fund um, the military build up on Guam when we have no idea when the first boots are going to land. Uh, we're going to buy money for uh, public safety equipment uh, to prepare for that eventuality and, and where respectfully sir and where I come from we only have three patrol cars um, uh, that's running and crime continues to increase. So I am going to need your help on that. But, um, um, but I, again, I will also, in all fairness, thank you, sir, and, and the attention that we, uh, the Northern Marian Islands, uh, continues to receive from your department, uh, continues to get better. Uh, 
more we need to do more, but it continues to get better. Um, but uh, I also would like to um, bring to your attention, and we br I brought this up to Director Good yesterday, where um, the issue of the Mariana Strange Marine Monument, um, there is no thought of that in the fiscal year 2012 budget. But well, maybe in, in future budgets uh, we would have some some movement on that uh, because this is an area uh, that's almost the size of Arizona, and um, and we um, it's a great proposal. I think it, you know it's it's going to be conserved. Three island units are involved in this, and uh, we need to eventually look at how to approach this and, and move forward with some of the promises that was made by the White House during negotiations for the establishment of this monument. But otherwise, Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for all that you do, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman, and thank you for bringing uh, the attention uh, to us uh, on the issues of uh, the territories and the islands. It is part of the jurisdiction of Interior, and we take it very seriously. And uh, Assistant Secretary Bobato is uh, working on all of the issues which uh, you raised, and uh, we will continue to try to make sure that we are honoring the partnership and the historic relationship that we've had with uh, the Mariana Islands. Thank you. Uh, uh, uh. Gentleman yields back. Appreciate that very much. Uh, gentleman from California, Mr. McClintock, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, welcome. The uh, Gulf oil disaster, as you've already testified, and its aftermath have been economically devastating uh, to the region and, for that matter, to the country. Ultimately, that disaster was caused by the catastrophic mechanical failure of the blowout preventer stack. Um, this committee received the report of the Graham Commission. I was astonished to learn that this commission had not only not determined the cause of the BP stack preventer uh, uh, failure, um, but had not even bothered to look at the blowout preventer. Uh, has this administration yet determined the reason for the failure of the blowout preventer? Well, the, the Deepwater Horizon and the Macondo well blowout uh, was caused uh, by problems relating to um, cementing and casing and other issues that were very appropriately identified by the Deepwater. Uh, had, had the blowout preventer the, uh, uh, functioned properly, we would not have had the disaster, correct? Let me, let me finish my, uh, the answer to my question. The, the, the blowout preventer is supposed to be the fail safe, which is a last resort to shut in a well. And it failed. Have you yet determined the cause of that mechanical failure? Uh, Congressman McClintock, there is a joint investigation that is underway. We're getting close to the very end of that investigation, and there will be a report, and we will be happy to share that report with you. Moving to uh, wind and solar, uh, don't we have to have a, a megawatt of reliable standby power for every megawatt of wind and solar that we place online? You know, the interruptibility issues are a reality when you're dealing with uh, wind and uh, solar energy, of course, and that's part of uh, what you deal so with. So the answer is yes. For every megawatt of wind or solar we put online, we also have to then have an additional megawatt of standby reliable power for the, those moments when the clouds pass over a solar array or the wind drops off, correct? Uh, I'm not... I don't have uh, the information to argue with your uh, statistics. I, I don't believe your statistics are correct, but I'd be happy to look into them. Well, it's an integrated grid. We have to constantly match the power being drawn off the grid with power, power being placed on the grid. Uh, wind and solar are not reliable sources of power, and we've got to keep a megawatt of backup power for every megawatt of wind and solar. It's not that complicated a, a, a situation, but it's extremely expensive. My question is, that at a time of skyrocketing electricity prices, Shouldn't we be focusing on the cheapest forms of electricity rather than subsidizing the most expensive and that expensive forms of electricity generation that also have to include an additional uh, backup supply? Uh, Congressman McClintock, I, I respectfully disagree because I think as you look at uh, one of the central issues, uh, which is uh, our national security as well as our economic security here in the country, uh, we need to develop uh, multiple sources of energy, including the clean energy resources, uh, which uh, many of which have been developed uh, in your state. And uh, we are very hopeful that that will be part of the clean energy future of America. We are falling far behind where uh, Germany and Spain and China and a lot of other countries are because uh, we have not opened up the door 
through this well, new energy world that we've worked on. So actually, photovoltaic technology was invented 175 years ago in 1836. And in 175 years of technological research and advancement, uh, have we yet invented a more expensive way of generating electricity? There are a number of uh, technologies that are underway, including a number of technologies which uh, we are standing up with uh, solar power plants that uh, we have authorized uh, in the deserts of the Southwest. So, so we're pouring untold billions of dollars, certainly hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, into uh, subsidies for the, the, the most expensive way that we've yet invented to produce electricity and have to require an additional uh, a backup supply to boot. Uh, sir, I, with all due respect, I don't think that is an intelligent energy policy. Uh, if I could just move to uh, land for a second, is the department still considering the Modoc Plateau for monument designation under the Antiquities Act? The what plateau? The Modoc Plateau in northern, northeastern California. Not, 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 to, not to my knowledge, uh, but with all due respect, uh, again, I think you're uh, wrong on your energy policy, and I don't think we can be living in uh, an energy policy that's... Uh, yeah, I, I understand. We disagree on that. So the, the, the uh, department has no further plans to uh, designate the Modoc Plateau uh, as a, uh, a monument under the Antiquities Act. I don't have any specific information on that. Uh, Last year, uh, to the Congress, uh, actually to this committee, you testified that uh, you had the discretion to waive the Endangered Species Act when it came to unemployment caused by the Delta smelt, smelt regulation, but uh, that by doing so it would be admitting failure. After all of the economic dislocation that's occurred in the Valley, uh, have you reconsidered that position? Well, that's uh, an incorrect statement of what I said, uh, but I'd be happy to take a look at it. The fact is that uh, ESA issues are very difficult and very complex, and uh, as uh, members of the California delegation and uh, Governor Schwarzenegger and Mr. others Mr. know. Secretary, could I ask you to, to respond to that question in, in writing, because uh, we are out of time on that particular question? Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the gentlelady from Ohio is recognized for five minutes. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and Secretary Salazar, thank you for your testimony today. In my district, I'm proud to uh, have the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. It's a large economic driver for our area, with many communities benefiting directly from the success of the park. Um, the Park Service, in fact, reported that in 2009, local spending at the park exceeded $50 million and added nearly 600 local jobs. Likewise, Lake Erie is also an economic engine of my region, and I noticed in your opening statement, um, you had mentioned the, being the guardian of Americans' oceans and Americans' lands, but we cannot forget the Great Lakes. Um, so Lake Erie, you know, an economic engine from manufacturing to boating to drinking water, the health of that lake is critically important to the people that I represent and I think to our nation as a whole. Lake Erie supports nearly 10% of Ohio's jobs and generates $750 million in state and local taxes. So I am extremely concerned that the budget, your budget calls for a $125 million cut to the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, and I'd like to have you talk a little bit more about that. Um, I understand that, that funding is a critical issue for the future, uh, however Lake Erie supports so very many jobs and the Cuyahoga Valley is such an important um, economic asset as well as natural asset to our area. So my questions are this, uh, I know that you're aware that the continuing resolution that the House passed two weeks ago decimated the funding for the Land and Water Conservation uh, Fund, providing the lowest level of this funding since 1965. You visited the Cuyahoga Valley National Park in 2009, so I know you're also familiar with the acquisition of land around uh, the Blossom Music Center by the park. And that Blossom acquisition was funded through uh, the appropriations process. The first piece in FY 2010 and the second and final piece was in the original FY 11 budget. But there are no funds for this project in the FY 2012 budget because it was assumed that the project would be concluded with funds in fiscal year uh, 2011. This funding is critical to the national park in our district and critical to uh, that acquisition project. Can you talk a little bit about the consequences of the, the cuts to the LWCF funding and the House passed continuing resolution on the, on the Blossom project? And then talk a little bit more about 
what uh, the budget going forward will mean for parks like ours, that uh, it's the only national park in Ohio. It is a, a, rare, uh, a rare gem um, in the middle of what people think of oftentimes as a very industrialized area. And if you could also just talk a little bit more about the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, um, which has been so incredibly important to our region's broader strategy to create jobs. Um, it has uh, been conveyed to me repeatedly by communities throughout our area that it was that park that kept them going through these tough times. Uh, Representative Sutton, I appreciate uh your energy and uh, your enthusiasm for uh, Cuyahoga National Park, and it was my honor to be there and to help uh, push along some of the renovations uh, that are so important to that community. And I think you so eloquently hit the point in terms of the economic nexus between uh, our outdoors and our national parks and, and local communities, indeed, in most states. Uh, when you think about tourism and uh, the jobs that are created through tourism, uh, it is a very significant part of our economy. and so as we deal with uh, the difficult economic times of getting America back on solid economic footing, I think these kinds of investments are exactly appropriate. Uh, I'm a strong supporter of uh, the Blossoms uh, expansion project there at Cuyahoga as well as other improvements that we have there. Uh, I don't know the specifics on the budget with respect to uh, Cuyahoga, but I would be happy to get back to you uh, with uh, that information. And on the Great Lakes, if I may, because that was your other question, uh, it is a uh, signature uh, landscape of the United States of America. And uh, I know how important it is uh, to all of you in Ohio and to the states who share that. Uh, we have a major initiative, interdepartmental, uh, where we are involved through a number of our different agencies at Interior. And uh, there is significant funding for the Great Lakes Initiative, and we hope to be able to continue to make uh, progress on the Great Lakes. I thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary, and I look forward to working with uh, the department to make sure that, that we are taking care of both the park and, uh, of course, our Great Lakes. Thank you. Thank you. Time of the gentlelady has expired. The gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Duncan. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Secretary Salazar, for being here today. Um, the events in the Middle East magnify the need for American energy independence. And we've heard uh, already this morning about the rising gas and fuel prices and the effect on the American economy. Uh, America is blessed with abundant resources. I've traveled all over the country. I've seen and visited national parks, wilderness areas, and enjoy the outdoors. But the abundant resources I want to talk about this morning include oil and natural gas resources and uh, what we have on federal lands. We've seen the policies of this administration continue to thwart the efforts for more domestic production at a time when we need it the most. Through policies such as the de facto moratorium on deep water drilling permits being issued in the post deep water horizon era, as well as limitations on hydraulic fracturing or, or fracking as it's known. The new budget proposal proposes cutting uh, or ending nearly one billion in existing programs such as those to fight wildland fires and economic development loans for Native Americans. Shifting these funds to areas like increased land acquisitions and the controversial national ocean policy as well as climate change uh, adaption. There is $14 million in this proposal uh, for new energy frontier initiative which mandates increasing capacity for renewable energy production on interior managed lands. In addition, the budget seeks $73 million for approval of wind, geothermal, and solar projects on public lands, a $14 million increase over last year. Um, American energy independence is a, is a national security issue. We have the resources here in this country. A lot of the federal land has been taken off the table. Um, what I would like to hear from you this morning is uh, the agency's opinion on increasing production of energy sources on federal land, uh, the de facto moratorium on offshore drilling permits and what's being done. I, I appreciate that one permit was issued uh, this week and uh, hopefully we'll see more of those, but uh, the de facto moratorium on issuing those permits, the expiring oil and natural gas leases that are affected. Uh, by those guys not being able to get out there and go to work. Uh, what are we going to do about uh, those leases? Are there going to be an extension on those uh, because they have been uh, prohibited from going to, to tap that? And then also future lease sales. Um, if you could answer those questions for me. Uh, thank you, Congressman. We uh, have uh, moved forward, as I said in my opening statement, with uh, a robust uh, oil and gas uh, and energy program, both uh, 
uh, onshore as well as offshore, both uh, conventional as well as uh, renewable. Uh, I'm proud of the record that we have and disagree with uh, the conclusions that you state. Uh, with respect to what we are doing to uh, increase production onshore, as I said, we uh, have issued uh, 5,200 leases in 2010. We expect that uh, there will be an additional 2,000 leases issued uh, this next year. There are 40 million plus acres that have been issued on, and are under lease for oil and gas development on the onshore. With respect to your second question on uh, what you call the uh, de facto moratorium, there is no moratorium. Uh, we are moving forward uh, in uh, a robust way to stand up uh, oil and gas drilling. The policy of the President has been to move forward with the development of oil and gas in the Gulf of Mexico and in, in the deep waters. And with respect to uh, excuse leases... Me, excuse me, let me interrupt you there, but by not issuing permits uh, for those guys to get back out there and go to work, even after they've met all the safety requirements uh, in the post-Deep Horizon era, uh, is a de facto moratorium. Well, they, it, with, with they had not met... The, you know, David Hayes and uh, Michael Bromwich and I were in Houston on Friday. And uh, what we did was uh, went out there to inspect firsthand uh, what was going on with uh, the oil spill containment mechanisms that are being built by both the Helix and the Marine Well Containment Corporation. As I said uh, during that trip, and as I'll say in front of this committee, I am pleased uh, with uh, the progress that industry is making at, at dealing with uh, the threat of uh, another type of Macondo well blowout. Uh, there is still significant progress to be made but it's on the basis of the oil spill containment as well as the safety regulations that we put into place for cementing and casing and third-party inspection and a whole host of other things that we are now able to move forward with uh, some assurance that we'll be able to have safe uh, drilling in uh, the deep oceans of America. In, in the remaining time, could you address future lease sales for me? We uh, are very hopeful and we are pushing hard to be able to meet the requirements so that we can have a, a lease sale in uh, the Gulf of Mexico yet this year. The time of the gentleman uh, has expired. General lady from Massachusetts, Ms. Songus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Secretary Salazar. I'd like to follow up on an issue that Congresswoman um, Sutton just raised. I think the administration's request for full funding of the Land and Water Conservation Fund uh, in fiscal year 2012 is a positive, positive step forward in securing some of our nation's most sacred and historic places. But I am concerned, as was she, that the recently passed continuing resolution will put, uh, will put critical projects proposed for the current fiscal year at serious risk, and that there will continue to be further aggressive steps to cut the LWCF. I'm especially concerned that further cuts to the LWCF will eliminate funding uh, for Minuteman National Historical Park's proposed acquisition of the Barrett Farmhouse. I'm fortunate to represent that park uh, located in Concord and Lexington, and it recently, uh, recently there was legislation passed that brought the Barrett Farm uh, within the outlines of the Minutemen National Historic Park. This may seem like a very local issue, but in fact, Barrett's Farm is an important piece of American Revolutionary War history. It was the farm at which the Minutemen stored their munitions. And when the British Army learned about that, it prompted their march on Lexington and Concord. And Paul Revere rode to alert the Minutemen that the British were coming, leading uh, Colonel Barrett uh, and his colleagues to hide the munitions so that when the British arrived, uh, the munitions were not, uh, they could not find them, and then led to the shot heard around the world. So it's a very important piece of American history. And the cut um, in the LWCF really does put at risk the park's ability to acquire uh, this farm for further preservation. It's been held over its many years by two uh, families who finally made it available for the park uh, to include it within their boundaries and now is in need of great restoration. So in addition to threatening Minuteman uh, Park's uh, capacity to acquire and preserve Barrett's farm, uh, what other nationally significant places would be put at risk by the funds, the cuts that are being proposed in the continuing resolution, and should the LWCF not be fully funded uh, in 2012? Okay. Representative, there are uh, 
projects like uh, the one you speak about all over the United States of America that would be uh, impacted. And the fact of the matter is that I think you hit the nail on the head, and that is that uh, these investments are investments uh, that create jobs here in America. Uh, there, there are tourists that come from throughout the world to visit places uh, like many of our revolutionary places, and uh, there are people throughout the country that uh, go to communities from the west uh, to uh, to your state, to all the states of the country, and uh, it's part of the huge economic activity, which is uh, a sustainable job creation program here in the country. And so, LWCF, in my view, has to be looked through that lens. Well, and the reality is also that um, it does perform, has great economic benefit. We've heard the figures given the way uh, the tourism, the generation of jobs, and all the other uh, economic activity that it promotes. But it also is a way in which we, we protect our past. And there is nothing like visiting some of these spaces and places uh, to have a deep appreciation of what we've accomplished as a nation. I don't know, I'm also fortunate to uh, represent a uh, historical national park in Lowell, Massachusetts. It is the first uh, urban national park. Uh, and the recently released America's Great Outdoors report highlighted the importance of urban parks and community green spaces and stated that the establishment of urban, urban parks was a priority of the initiative. And again, to address the issue of the role, economic development role of parks, uh, not only did this park protect, protect a cultural and um, historic legacy of a place that was the birthplace of the American Revolution uh, led to the preservation of architectural treasures, but it led to the revitalization of a city. And, and it, because of that steady stream of federal funding that has come in has really jump-started significant investment in uh, through the private sector, through the nonprofit sector, uh, through state and local initiatives that might not otherwise have taken in place. So it played a critically important role, and I'd love to invite you to come visit it, especially as you um, undertake the um, American Great Outdoors uh, in initiative and, and encourage you to think about uh, urban settings for those, those outdoors initiatives as well. Thank you, and I yield back. I thank the gentlelady for uh, yielding back. But not if you're going to say you come visit. <laughs> I, I will. Lowell is one of the great examples of a great urban park, and you find them at St. Louis with the Arch, where we have a great vision for what we can do there to connect up three million people to that park, and that every community around the country, frankly, has uh, those kinds of opportunities. So I will come to Lowell uh, to illustrate what you have done at Lowell, because we can do it everywhere else in the country as well. I, I take that as, so as being a yes. I take it as a yes, too. <laughs> Thank you so much. Gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Tipton, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. Uh, we come from common areas. Uh, my third congressional district has your ancestral home uh, over on the San Luis Valley, and I've just completed a tour, uh, my third, throughout the third CD since being elected. And we, we have a lot of challenges uh, that we face. On the western slope of Colorado, better than 70 percent of our property is either federal, state, or tribal lands. Going through and visiting in our district, uh, we have multiple issues uh, that people are concerned about. The wildlands policy. Uh, there was a great offense and concern that there were, were no public hearings uh, that were held in terms of addressing some of these issues. We have in Mesa County, uh, the county that had the highest per capita unemployment at one point last year in the entire United States, relies an awful lot on the development, responsible development of our natural resources in the third congressional district to be able to benefit America. Uh, we also have a lot of senior citizens, young families uh, that are struggling right now to be able to pay their bills, and they're seeing regulatory tax increases that are coming through from policies out of the federal government that are impacting those electric bills, their ability to be able to meet their families' needs. And so I appreciate you taking the time to be here today and have just a few questions uh, that I, I'd like to be able to hear some of your thoughts on. Uh, and first of all, in regards to uh, some of the wildlands issues uh, that we're going through, I did visit with uh, ranchers, the oil and gas industry, local governments, uh, the mineral industry, motorized recreational users, and they've all voiced strong opposition uh, to the wildlands policy that is coming out. And I just wanted to question you, uh, did you give a directive out uh, to the BM officials in the various districts, say in the third congressional district, to reach out to these groups prior to developing this concept? We have been uh, in uh, 
significant communications with uh, affected communities, and those uh, communications will continue. I think it would be useful for co you, Congressman uh, Tipton, maybe to hear from uh, David Hayes, who's been helping uh, in the development of this policy and its implementation for just a, a minute or so. David. Uh, uh, Congressman, the uh, uh, fundamental to the policy is, in fact, that no wild lands will be identified until there is a robust discussion at the local and state level uh, through the amendment process, or if there are special projects proposed uh, through a, a special uh, uh, discussion. So uh, there's been a fundamental misunderstanding along those lines. But the, uh, Great. Uh, the uh, guidance. Mr. Hayes, I'm, I apologize, sure. but we're Go kind ahead. of short on time. Uh, I did visit, visit with field office. One of the concerns I think we had is uh, seeing an industry that's trying to be able to create jobs, trying to meet America's energy needs. And one of the problems that they're facing right now is some of the new technologies to be able to do some of the lateral drilling. And under the wildlands policy, they are already, without public input, they are already enforcing policy that, uh, no, we aren't going to allow you to drill underneath those public lands to be able to extract that natural resource, never disturbing the surface. So uh, you might want to visit uh, with uh, some of your local folks because I think that uh, whether or not nothing is supposed to be done at this point, it's starting already to be able to happen. But if I may kind of move on here, uh, when we were talking a little bit, and I, I apologize, I had to step out, uh, when you're talking about doing a good job and getting a fair return for the American taxpayer. Have you run a cost-benefit analysis when we're increasing the budget by approximately $14 million for some of the renewables uh, going? Uh, I think the budget request right now is about $73 million. Have you done a cost-benefit analysis in terms of that return? Uh, Congressman Tipton, uh we have not done that I am aware of a cost-benefit analysis with respect to the investments in renewable energy. We have, and I am very proud of the fact that we have made significant progress in demonstrating the viability of wind and solar and geothermal energies in uh, many places, but in particular in the southwestern part of the United States and uh, communities, for example, in Milford, Utah, where we have a huge wind project and the potential right. solar project and transmission line and there are places in Colorado as well. Great. That can benefit. Yeah, and one thing I think uh, I'd really encourage you to take a look at this, uh, you know, because I think it's important in these tough economic times because I've literally walked the streets of, of Alamosa, of uh, a lot of towns and a number of people here haven't heard of. And people are struggling right now. And some of these costs, we need to do these cost-benefit analysis because that will go to the electric bill. Uh, one of the problems we have also is, is with some of the hydroelectric. Uh, we release an artificial floods out of the Glen Canyon Dam. Uh, I'm sorry, we ran out of time. May I submit Ted. some questions to you? Absolutely. Appreciate that. Feel free Thanks. to call me anytime. Good. Thank you very much. I appreciate the gentleman's time. His time has expired. The gentleman from uh, New Mexico, Mr. Lujan. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And to Mr. Uh, Secretary Salazar and uh, Deputy Secretary Hayes, I want to thank you for being here. And, you know, oftentimes, sometimes we can be tough with you, but we appreciate the compassion and the passion that you share for our nation, for the people, and for the responsibilities that you have. And I think sometimes we need to sit back and truly understand how we have to come together to work together as a team. And in light of many of the things that have taken place across the country, that time is now and we have to get there. So again, I appreciate your patience today, Mr. Secretary, and your indulgence. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you again for holding this important hearing and for inviting Secretary Salazar and for the team to be with us today. New Mexico is a very special place with a very close connection to the Department of Interior. Like many other states in the West, we rely on the support for projects from the Department of Interior to make critical investments in rural and oftentimes disadvantaged areas. My district in New Mexico includes 15 pueblos, the Hickory Apache Nation, and a portion of the Navajo Nation, two national forests, approximately 2.5 million acres of BLM land, two wildlife refuge, four Bureau of Reclamation dams, and seven national parks and monuments. You can see this is important to me. So you can see how closely attached the Department of Interior is to the people of New Mexico and to our public lands. Often the need for adequate funding within the Department of Interior is clear and present in the daily lives of my constituents. The investments Department of Interior makes are critical to my state and our nation. And as I said yesterday in our subcommittee with the BOR, 
These investments strengthen the backbone of America by making resources available for economies to grow, and without them, critical infrastructure resource management would be virtually non-existent for the people of New Mexico. So the funding levels and the budget request for the 2012 fiscal cycle are important to maintain our public lands. Uh, Mr. Secretary, before I ask a few questions, and I'll, whatever I don't get to, I'm going to submit them for uh, a response in writing. There's been a lot of discussion about uh, the cost of oil today. And I think that we all need to be aware of this, because back home, this is hurting people. It's going to drive up the cost of eggs, milk, bread, every part of everybody's life. But there was a question that you were asked early on, and you, your response included some information about where we were in the United States in 2010. And I was curious if you could please share that information with us as a, again, um, if you can get find it. One thing I want to point out is that, and I don't know if it's been talked about, Mr. Chairman, but in today's Financial Times, there was an article that said that U.S. oil production last year rose to its highest level in almost a decade. As a result, analysts believe the U.S. was the largest contributor to the increase in global oil supplies last year over 2009 and is on track to increase domestic production by 25 percent of the second half of the decade. According to the U.S. government's Energy Information Administration, domestic production of crude oil and related liquids rose 3 percent last year to an average of 7.51 million barrels a day, its highest level since 2002. I think that there's some options that we have, Mr. Secretary, and I know that Senator Bingaman, along with Chairman Markey, have asked for the President to consider using strategic oil reserves, and I think that's something that we need to take seriously, because these prices are being driven up by speculation of what's happening in the Middle East, and we don't have a seat with those OPEC cartels. We need to make sure that we're solving these problems domestically, but again, that we're paying credit where credit is due. And it's important that we look at this closely. This is one of those areas where we have to come together as a Congress, as a nation, to make sure that we are going to provide the necessary relief to the American people during these very fragile economic times. Um, so, Mr. Secretary, the first question that I would ask, and if you could uh, include the response that you have there, and I see my time has quickly run out, Mr. Chairman. So, most of my questions, uh, Mr. Secretary, involve uh, funding for our tribes, not only with concerns that I have with BIE schools, with funding that has been allocated, but sometimes may take up to a decade to get out to our communities. And I'm hoping that we can visit some of those issues and I'll submit those into the record. I certainly look to make sure that also as we take into consideration some of the cuts that are being recommended, and I know they're tough ones, that tribes are not hit more than anyone else. And tribal leaders have told me that we don't mind the reductions as long as we're treated fairly. And so, Mr. Secretary, I apologize for taking up the time uh, there without giving you a chance to respond. I'll submit these to the record, but I thought it was important that we shed some light, especially on what's happening with the price of oil, and that there are true answers that are amongst us to be able to provide relief to the American people. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I thank the gentleman, and uh, we have established a precedent. When a question is asked and time runs out, the secretary will respond. So, uh, uh, but I appreciate the gentleman uh, uh, looking at that. Gentleman from uh, Arizona, Mr. Gosar, is recognized for five minutes. Good afternoon, Secretary Salazar, and thank you. I represent Arizona's first congressional district, one of the largest congressional districts in the country. The district is comprised of 26.1 million acres of federal and tribal lands, close to 70 percent of the total land. I have particular concerns about the millions of dollars proposed in the President's budget for the purchase, proposed pur purchase for more federal lands, particularly in light of the estimated billions of dollars of maintenance and management backlog backlogs that are existing on federally owned lands. Proper forest maintenance and management is very important to me in my community, particularly in light of a tragedy that occurred last year in my hometown of Flagstaff, Arizona. And it's to this that I would like to highlight the need for proper management and maintenance of existing, existing inventory. As you know, last June a wildfire destroyed more than 15,000 acres of steep terrain in the Coconino National Forest known as the Schultz Pass. The wildfires scorched earth on this steep volcanic terrain, leaving little ground vegetation to absorb and hold back rainwater. In addition, unusually high concentrations of forest fuels that have built over decades ignited and baked the unusually crumbled volcan uh, volcanic day site into a crystal-like impervious substance, which takes decades to be broken down just to grow grass. On July 6, 2010, 
2010, the Forest Service Burnier Emergency Response Team issued a report to the residents living near the base of the peaks stating they would face a constant daily flooding threat from summer monsoon storms and publicly urged them to purchase flood insurance. Two weeks later, before insurance could be enacted, nearly two inches of rain fell in less than an hour, causing flash flooding to the communities downstream from the Schultz Fast Fire. Widespread flooding and debris disrupted and destroyed uh, public infrastructure, damaged approximately 32 homes in the community, and tragically led to the death of a 12-year-old girl. There are some great long-term ideas and projects in the works for maintenance and stewardship of our forests, such as the Four Forest Restoration Initiative, which works with local communities to manage them, and it's time that we got people back to work. However, my community has an urgent need for short-term protection measures to be implemented before the summer monsoon seasons begin. Up to 1,200 homes are now considered to be in a flood zone, and owners are living with uncertainty about their personal safety, financial risk, and the inability to obtain flood insurance. Coconino County is making progress on developing an engineering floodplain control plan and getting as many parties to the table as possible to assist in their efforts. Members of the community have taken desperate measures to, in, to mitigate short-term flood risks, digging trenches, canals, placing sandbags around their homes. A group of homeowners in a high-risk area have tried to build built a coalition and have volunteered to build check dams on the federal land, but have been de denied access to the land by the Forest Service. The Forest Service has not committed to mitigation projects on the national forest, such as diversion channels, retention basins, even water barriers constructed from the remains of cut, burned trees locked behind existing stumps. The Forest Service, because of the wilderness designation that existed for this area prior, will not allow county equipment on site to repair a water pipeline damaged by the fire and flooding that the city desperately needs. We need your help now. Another disaster could occur if actions are not taken before July the beginning of the monsoon season. It is critical the Forest Service and other relevant government agencies under your jurisdiction coordinate together and with local communities to expedite the flood protection measures to address the immediate threat posed by the post-fire and flood, flood land conditions. I invite you to join me in Flagstaff at your earliest convenience and my community will show you the urgency of this situation. We have a pending emergency and we need your direct assistance. Will you help us? Congressman Gosar, I'd be happy to find out more about it and see what it is that uh, we can do and uh, have conversations with my colleague uh, Tom Vilsack uh, and uh, members of the Forest Service to see how, if there is anything that we can do to be helpful. Uh, you describe a situation which obviously I am sure is uh, not only of concern to you but uh, to a lot of other people. I would look to your earliest response, please. Thank you. Good. Yield back my time. I thank the gentleman for yielding back. The uh, gentleman from California, Mr. Garamondi, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Secretary, and Deputy Secretary. Thank you very much for your patience and for your, uh, your answers. Repeatedly, my colleagues on the other side of this horseshoe have tried to blame you for the rapidly increasing price of oil. It seems to me beyond ludicrous to do so, unless one were to uh, think that somehow you're responsible for the uprisings in Libya and Egypt, the war in Iraq, the rise of China and India, and their demand for oil. Having said that, I might recommend that next time uh, you come, you come with a PowerPoint and present to us all of the information that you've not been allowed to present. Specifically, what you have done to increase the production of oil and gas in the United States. You have a remarkable story. You've gotten some of it out. I'm going to give you the rest of this time, except for the last minute, to put those facts into this record. What have you done and what has, what has happened with regard to oil and gas production in the United States over the last couple of years? Thank you very much, uh, Congressman Garamandi. And let me just say, I think that we all need to put this in the context of the overall comprehensive energy program which uh, the President has advocated, which uh, he addressed in the State of the Union. Uh, first, uh, we need to uh, continue to move forward with uh, conventional uh, oil and gas production as well as other uh, energy resources. Secondly, we need to open the door to new energy resources such as solar and geothermal and wind, which uh, we, have, we have spoken about. And third, we also need to address the issue of efficiency and uh, major progress which we have made in the last two years to reduce the consumption of oil uh, within our country. And so all of those things have to be done. Focusing specifically, though, on just the oil and gas facts, uh, to me, the, the top lines are very interesting. I mean, the fact that uh, 
we have gone from importing 50 percent of our oil or, or 60 percent of our oil just a few years ago to now where we're importing only 50 percent of our oil. Uh, the fact that we have increased uh, by more than a third uh, the amount of oil that uh, we are uh, bringing from uh, the Outer Continental Shelf, the fact that we've increased uh, by 5 percent the amount of oil that we're producing from our uh, public lands onshore. Uh, the fact that we are increasing the amount of natural gas that is being produced onshore. So the statistics uh, speak for themselves in terms of uh, the amount of oil and gas that is being produced domestically, as well as the acreage that is being made available both offshore as well as onshore uh, to, to, increase, uh, to increase production. I thank you for that. And if you could uh, provide the additional detail for the record, it would be very helpful to us. Uh, sometimes facts make inconvenient arguments when one wants to be on ideology rather than facts. With regard to wildlands, Assist, uh, Deputy Secretary Hayes, for several times you've attempted to explain the wildlands policy. If you could lay out why the Secretary order has been uh, promulgated and how you are implementing it, uh, it would be helpful to all of us. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Um, the, the order is, has been uh, laid out to provide more clarity uh, to all parties with interest in public lands regarding the availability of lands for different purposes. Uh, as, as you know, the Secretary has the legal obligation to consider multiple uses of lands. Uh, one of those uses uh, authorized and required by law is to consider conservation. And for some lands, it makes sense that that is the use that, that is identified for those lands. Right now, there is enormous confusion uh, on many public lands about what lands are available or what are not or what are appropriate for leasing or what are not. Uh, Utah is a perfect example. 2.4 million acres of land have been identified as having wilderness characteristics, uh, but because there's been no guidance to BLM folks about whether those lands uh, are appropriate for, for specific uses or not, uh, no review, no discussion. Um, the, uh, where leasing has gone ahead, many of the leases have been protested. In Utah, more than 50 percent of all leases are protested, in part because of the, 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 the conservation groups and others uh, are, are just now routinely uh, filing uh, 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 protests since there is no clarity as to whether certain lands are appropriate for oil and gas leasing or not. Uh, the idea here is simply to improve the process, the public process, that will answer that question so that there's clarity on all sides as to the, the areas. It is not true that all lands with uh, wilderness characteristics will be uh, characterized as wildlands. As Bob Abbey, the BLM director, just testified two days ago, in Utah, the first example that came forward, a proposed potash facility on lands with wilderness characteristics, was, was determined to go forward under that policy. So we're looking forward to a robust dialogue through the process of, 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 uh, of RMPs uh, and, and active. Some of those lands should be identified as wild lands. Time of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Flores. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Secretary Salazar and the rest of your team for joining us today. I have an opening statement that I've prepared that will be submitted for the record separately. I'd like to start with the preamble that um, our domestic energy resources are an important component of being able to grow a strong domestic economy, to be able to provide good private sector jobs, and to promote our national defense. Uh, Department of Interior's activities to affect drilling uh, permit moratoria, drilling permit slowdowns, are hurting all of those. I'd also submit that our best strategic energy reserves are not those in the strategic petroleum reserves. They're those on the public lands that our taxpayers own, the public lands and offshore areas. We're one of the few countries in the world, if not the only country in the world, that puts our domestic resources off limits so that we're forced to import from other, other countries. Since 2008, the energy royalties and lease income from the federal government, and before you try to rebut my facts, this comes from the Office of Natural Resources Revenue, uh, says that our revenues from offshore in 2008 have gone from $16 billion to $8 billion. That certainly is not a good way to handle a taxpayer resource. And the alternative, we should be capitalizing on the trillions of dollars of taxpayer-owned national resources that we have to grow our economy, fuel domestic job growth, and assure our national security. Not only did the Department of Energy enact a drilling moratorium in deep water, it is also engaged in a dramatic slowdown 
in issuing shallow water permitting, which is operated in an environment which is operated in an environmentally safe manner for over 30 years. And before we try to rebut those facts, the average number of, of uh, new well permits in the years 2006 to 2008 was 330 a year. Last year it was 104. This year it's been 13, and that comes from the uh, BOMRE database. Um, what's next? The actions of the Department of Interior, an integral component of the current increase in gasoline prices, which began before the Middle East uncertainty, and each $1 increase in gasoline prices is a $120 billion tax on the consumers of this country. And I would submit to you that that dwarfs the 10,000 megawatts of power that the Department of Energy is trying to produce or the impact of the entire budget of the Department of Energy, of the Department of Interior. Historically, the U.S. has always been a country that companies wanted to do business in because they had, we had, we followed the rule of law and we, we didn't, and we also had a transparent permitting process uh, that was, that was uh, not arbitrarily followed. I've been involved with offshore drilling all around the world, and I've seen both models where we follow the rule of law and where we have arbitrary and capricious regulatory models. And what I've seen particularly in shallow water drilling in the last uh, uh, few months has been the latter. And that's not the way to grow, uh, to make ourselves more energy secure. So my question is this, how do the Department of Interior's actions serve to grow the American economy, to help promote private sector job growth to assure our national security, not only for current generations, but for future generations. Congressman Flores, I appreciate the, uh, the question. First, uh, in terms of uh, what we do relative to be part of the uh, e eco economy of this country, we do it both uh, with respect to oil and gas as well as with respect to other energy resources, as well as with respect to many of the outdoor recreational uh, programs that uh, we have spoken about this morning. And those can coexist, I believe, can't they? And They, they can, and we, we believe that that's part of uh, what we are uh, attempting to do within the Department of Interior. A uh, couple of points with respect to the revenue issue that you raised. Uh, 2008 was a year in which uh, oil and gas prices were high, so that was an abnormal amount of revenue that, that we received that year. Uh, on average, we get nine, ten, eleven billion dollars a year, and uh, we're on track to do that uh, for this year from uh, oil and gas production. In terms of permits, uh, I think you would understand, uh, being from uh, the energy world, that after uh, the Deepwater Horizon and the uh, uh, expectation that you would never see a Maconda Well style blowout, that we had to take action to make sure that we were protecting people, uh, like those eleven people that were killed on the rig. As yes, well sir. As uh, making uh, sure do you look at shallow water drilling? Yes. We haven't had issues in shallow water drilling for 30 years, and we've had a dramatic slowdown in the issuance of shallow water drilling permits. Uh, Congressman, we have uh, moved forward with uh, uh, shallow water permitting. There were additional requirements on safety that we uh, impose on the shallow water drillers. There are 37 uh, permits that have already been issued, and we expect to have a uh, robust uh, oil and gas uh, production coming out of the Gulf. I think. And I would ask you, Congressman Flores, to think about this, that uh, our policy program and objective here is the same. Uh, the President of the United States and I support a uh, strong uh, oil and gas uh, production in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, I would expect that you, as well as other members of the industry, would want us to do it in a safe way that protects people and protects the environment. Uh, that is why the budget that is in front of you is a part of that effort to make sure that we're able to do that. I would hope that we in America can create the gold standard for safe oil and gas production in the oceans of this world. Time of the gentleman, uh, time of the gentleman has expired. Gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Grijalva. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mr. Secretary. Thank you uh, for uh, I, let me extend my uh, appreciation for uh, the job that you're doing, uh, the very difficult job of balancing uh, extraction from our public lands and waters, and balancing that with the preservation, conservation, and recreational needs of those lands and waters as well. And uh, it's a difficult job, and uh, let me extend my appreciation for the fine job you're doing with that. Uh, I was, just for the record, at, at, uh, there were seven shallow water permits issued in December, which matches the monthly total from the year before the spill occurred. So uh, 
in reference to the point that you made, Mr. Secretary, uh, uh, facts do come into play in this whole discussion, and I hope as we go forward with this discussion, as the Chairman indicated, uh, that facts and science play a role in the deliberations. Uh, I, and, and, and I, you know, as, as, as the Middle East and Libya in particular struggle to form some form of uh, democratic gover governance in their own countries, uh, those are ter terrific challenges. I hope that uh, that struggle doesn't become an opportunity to, to shield for the oil and gas industry to go back to some unregulated winner-take-all policy with regard to extraction from our lands and waters. There's prudence involved here, and there's the safety and the health of the American people as well. Uh, Land and Water Conservation Fund. Uh, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle uh, took the President's $900 million recommendation, uh, drove it down, cut it down to 60. Implications in terms of what that, if that figure were to hold, uh, what would be the implications for uh, the work of the Interior Department and the work of communities in terms of that fund? And we've already established the fact that we're not cutting, we're not saving, and it's not costing the taxpayer any money in the Land and Conservation Fund. That was established earlier in this hearing. So I just want to know what would be the implications of that. Then I have a couple of other quick questions. Well, first on, uh, Congressman uh, Grijalva, thank you for your... Uh leadership, especially uh, working on so many issues that are important to interior and to the nation uh, in your district in Arizona. With respect to oil and gas leases, uh, you are correct. Uh, the numbers are out there. We'd be happy to get the specifics, but we uh, have moved forward as quickly as we can when we were at a point in time where we could assure that we were moving forward in a, in a safe way in the issuance of permits, and so that's why you have seen uh, the additional shallow water permits issued, and we hope to be able to move forward with additional deep water permits as well in, in uh, the relatively uh, short future. With respect to the Land and Water Conservation Fund, uh, it is a modest investment in the future of America because the dollars that we are putting in to buying in holdings and uh, connecting up wildlife corridors and uh, doing <coughs> the rest of the things to get American people into the outdoors are important to the hunters uh, and anglers of this country. They're important to the bikers of this country. And they're a huge part of the economic engine of the United States of America. As I said earlier, just the outdoor industry alone uh, independently will tell you that there are six and a half million jobs created a year in this country. Those are not jobs that can be exported. So the kinds of investments that we make with LWCF uh, are enhancing that economic future for the U.S. Thank you. And one quick, you know, the, the CLEAR Act uh, passed the House, didn't go anywhere in the Senate. And part of that... Uh, was some of the reforms that you had recommended uh, after after the spill and things that needed to be done internally and externally. Uh, now that we're talking about this budget, are you still going to have the capacity internally to, you did some administrative changes, to carry out some of those administrative changes given the resources that might or might not be available to the department so that we can continue to prevent what happened in the Gulf from not happening again. The uh, request that we have in the President's budget for uh, offshore uh, oil and gas activities uh, for the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management are essential for us to move forward with a robust uh, oil and gas uh, permitting program uh, in the nation's oceans. Uh, without those resources, uh, frankly, uh, we are not going to be able to move forward with a permitting process uh, in the way that we Thank want you. to because you need to have people to be able to go out and uh, do the jobs, issue the permits, uh, do the inspections, do the monitoring. Thank you. All that needs to happen, and so that is one of the that, that is one of the initiatives that is at risk if that part of this budget is not funded. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, the other questions that I have with everything from bats to wild horses to uh, uh, I will uh, 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 the wild horses being something that I know the secretary likes to hear about from me. Uh, I will uh, submit those in writing, sir. And you be sure to uh, share the response uh, with all of the members. Well, depends what it is. No, I'm done. I, of course I will. Uh, the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Landry, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I will, will dispute some of your facts, uh, which I'm sure you'll go back and dispute. But the Department of Energy shows that we've got about a 300,000 barrel loss in Gulf of Mexico production. But the one fact that is undisputable 
is that Americans have been paying more at the pump since January of 2009 until today. The price at the pump has continued to increase. Now, I'm going to give you an opportunity to explain this robust energy policy that y'all are trying to lay out for me. You implemented the drilling safety rule for offshore to enhance safety in upstream oil and gas business. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Does this rule apply to dr drilling activity onshore, on onshore federal lands? There are different realities uh, onshore. And, and would you say that those realities are based on, on past history and safety aspects? The, the realities are based on uh, experiences as well as just the, the differences of regulating in the offshore and the onshore. And let me be specific. When you start dealing with uh, the Gulf of Mexico, which I know you're very concerned about, and you start uh, drilling in places that are 5,000, 6,000. Okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. but I don't want to go there yet because what I want to show you is that based upon the history on the shelf, with over 40,000 wells drilled on, on our shelf, we have not had an accident on that shelf in any magnitude in the deep water, and yet our, our shallow water permits continue, continue to lag. In fact, a three-year permit average from 2007 to 2009 had an average of 28 permits per month that were issued. In the first quarter of 2010, that average was 21. In the second quarter of 2010, it was 12. The third, 13. The fourth, 18. The average for this year is six. Now. What I'm trying to, sh what, I'm tr what I want you to explain to me is that if you're not, if, if, you, if you're saying that the onshore drilling is safe and you're using a history, uh, which I think is correct, but yet the shelf has that same history and safety record, but yet you're treating it different. To me, that's not robust. In fact, not only are your drilling permits and your construction permits lagging, but I have oil and gas companies who are trying to keep people to work in my district doing P&A work, plugging and abandoning at a time when I think it was your, your agency who had, made the, um, who had made some comments back after the Deepwater Horizon in incident that the industry should be cleaning up some of its idle iron. Well, I want you to know that the permit process in New Orleans is at a dead standstill when it comes to P&A work. Now, this is work that the administration claims needs to be done. And when I look at the budget, I wonder if you're actually utilizing your resources because if, it's, if, if I'm not mistaken, um, the, uh, the BOM offices, if you give me a second, are, are, are scattered out from Houston to New Orleans. I think there's one in Lake Charles. And, well, there's one in New Orleans, Homer, Lafayette, Lake Charles, and Lake Jackson. And it seems to me that we could do some consolidation and get some streamlining, at least for P&A permits, um, uh, uh, so, that, so that we can keep people to work while y'all continue this robust energy uh, policy that we're moving forward. Wouldn't you agree? If I may, on your uh, comments, just quickly two points. The first is on the issue of gas prices. The fact is that uh, the price of oil is set worldwide, and uh, but we are able to influence that in terms of domestic production. The experts, the economists tell us that we don't have an influence on that. Well, well but, if, but if that's the case, then how can my gentleman, how can the gentleman on the other side of this aisle claim that utilizing the strategic reserve would give us some relief at the pump? Because all that is is increasing the supply. Well, the, the, yes, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve is a tool that was set up to deal with uh, disruptions in the market after uh, incidents like uh, OPEC and perhaps uh, the incident now. But and for in incidents of national security. But we've got a great strategic reserve in the Gulf of Mexico I agree. That, is, that, is, that is a lot cheaper than utilizing that one. But I don't understand. At first you said it's set by, by, by uh, it, the price is set on the world market, and I agree with that. But what affects that price is supply and demand. Don't you agree? That's true, including the demand from China and India and uh, the rest of the world. But there's also a, a reason why Brent crude oil prices are higher <clears throat> than U.S. crude prices, and sometimes it has to do with delivery options. And so my point is, is that when we when we drill domestically, the ability to get that resource into our refineries comes at a much lesser cost because of the transportation costs out there. So all of those things come into a factor when you should be considering your energy policy. And that's why I think that it's failed that you're treating the, the Gulf of Mexico and you're painting it with one brush. 
time me, of the year. Let me just say the, 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 the fact is that we have increased production in the country. Those facts are indisputable over the last two years. And secondly, your, your legitimate question, which you ask, which isn't just a political uh, diatribe, is uh, the, is the uh, question of how we are doing the new Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and the consolidation. There are legitimate questions that you raise there, and we're looking at those very seriously. And what we want to do is to establish a robust agency that can, in fact, uh, do the job that it has to do, and it may include some of the consolidations and some of the moves that uh, you uh, raised in your question. Time of the gentleman has expired. Uh, the gentlelady from California, Ms. No uh, Napolitano, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, good to see you again, Mr. Secretary, uh, Mr. Hastings. Uh, there are some questions that I want to have to uh, submit for the uh, uh, record, uh, if you wouldn't mind returning them in writing for this uh, uh, committee. Um, but I certainly want to um, um, kind of dovetail some of the comments on the uh, hydrofracking uh, for the fact that uh, there are some issues in my backyard that are beginning to uh, affect um, the residents' uh, concerns over the uh, contaminated water that hydrofracking leaves behind. Um, and I'm not sure whether we can address it or whether we can uh, maybe help those uh, uh, folks be able to understand it. California crude is heavier than most of the other crude. Uh, secondly, <coughs> pardon me, I want to um, congratulate um, Commissioner Connor for working heavily with us on Title 16, especially with the era money, to make real water and put people to work. Uh, that uh, is, uh, is just uh, absolutely a must in the West. And uh, then uh, m moving into the uh, Native American focus, um, the tribal recognition, um, moving forth on that and uh, putting a lot more focus on some of their issues. Uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs received a budget increase uh, for energy initiatives, and I know that IBEW Electrical Workers and NICA, the electrical contractors, have submitted a white paper um, including um, uh, some of the reservations in my area that are looking at uh, placing on-site uh, manufacturing of solar panels and training of Native Americans for jobs into the uh, um, uh, electrical contracting or electrical manufacturing, electrical contracting. So that develops not only uh, uh, jobs, it uh, brings back manufacturing to the U.S., uh, brings solar panel manufacturing to the U.S., provides electrical journeyman uh, training to Native Americans as they get job development and economic development. And there's 20 tribes actually lined up to work with these two uh, organizations that are moving forth on this, and I'd love to have to see where the department is on this and uh, um, if there's going to be any focus to help Native Americans be able to uh, have that uh, ability to do this. Secondly, um, the budget request includes a new account for National Land Imaging Program, overseeing the operation of the Landsat satellites, uh, providing global land cover data uh, used by academia, agriculture, uh, researchers, the world, in fact. Uh, I'd like to congratulate the department on the work done so far in the Water and Science Agency in the Landsat. Uh, one of the concerns I have is that it is essential to the imaging environment impacts, the ground and aquifer imaging. Uh, the DOI budget request, it, will it be sufficient to ensure that the land-based operations are ready to handle the thermal infrared censoring, the T TIRS, T-I-R-S, when Landsat 8 launches in uh, December of next year? Uh, we've been told by many of the water agencies they utilize this information. They, it's critical for them. It's critical for farmers. Um, and uh, then thirdly, the water challenges, the water shortages and water use conflicts is one of your seven initiatives for 2012. How will the proposed reductions in spending for these basic data gathering, of course the USGS stream gauging and the groundwater monitoring specifically, that affect the work that we do on water, impact DOI's ability to fulfill its statutory mandates, affect decision support, and impact states and other non-federal partners. Uh, I could go on, but those are the ones that I really have, uh, and uh, you can take any one of them and the rest I'll submit for the record, because I will be yielding, well, in fact, I'll, all of them for the record, and I yield one minute to Mr. Garamendi. Thank you. Uh, a lot of discussion going on here about energy. But I would point out that uh, the oil market is an international market. And whatever happens here in the United States with drilling and the like is 
not going to change that price of oil very much. Uh, we should also note that the uh, oil industry, the big five, in the last decade had just short of a trillion dollars in profits. And as this price rises, uh, we're going to see that 18 or 16 billion uh, go back up from whatever it is today, as, as was discussed. Uh, I want to commend the department for every effort you're making to become energy less dependent on uh, grid energy and more dependent on uh, renewable energy. You're doing a lot. What you've done in the deserts uh, with your renewables, very good. More needs to be done. We know we have a series of problems, and I know that you're trying to attack those problems so that we can move away from our dependency on foreign oil. Uh, your record is very good. You should stay with it. Time of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Johnson, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Salazar, Ohio is very dependent uh, upon the coal industry. We get about 87 percent of our energy uh, from coal, and the industry supports more than 30,000 direct and indirect jobs, and the majority of these jobs are in my district in eastern and southeastern Ohio. As you know, the Office of Surface Mining uh, Reclamation and Enforcement is preparing a complete rewrite of current regulations regarding surface mining in the stream buffer zone. According to your department's own environmental impact statement, this proposed regulation could cost more than 20,000 coal mining and related jobs, cut coal production, uh, coal mining production by 50 percent, and increase the cost of electricity for families and small businesses. What is your justification for such a significant rewrite of existing regulations? Uh, that would result in such significant job losses and jeopardize our domestic energy security. We'll have uh, Deputy Secretary Hayes respond. Uh, Congressman, we're, we're looking at a, a fresh at the rule because a court uh, uh, intervened and uh, expressed concern about the, uh, the, the, the rule that came out at the end of the prior administration. Uh, I should say that the rulemaking has, uh, has only started, uh, that you referenced the environmental impact statement. There is no draft environmental impact statement that is out yet. Uh, what you're referring to was a draft that was prepared by a contractor uh, and that was not approved by the department. We are very concerned and want to make sure that this rulemaking uh, proceeds and the environmental impact statement proceeds with full public input. We have made no judgments about what the final rule will look like, and we look forward to working with you and others to make sure that it's a good rule and it makes sense uh, in coal country. Well, I, I'm, I'm very concerned because you, the 2000 rule uh, that, that you referenced followed a five-year rulemaking rule process uh, supported by 5,000 plus pages of environmental analysis and 40,000 public comments. Uh, I'm just very concerned why OSM is in such a rush uh, to rewrite this rule that has already codified 30 years of industry practice. We're, we're not in a rush. We are acting under court supervision. The court has established some deadlines for us to proceed. Uh, but we will make sure that we proceed in a deliberate way. Uh, and again, uh, there is no uh, draft environmental impact statement out yet. Uh, when it comes out, we'll look forward to uh, input uh, along with the rulemaking itself. Shifting, uh, shifting gears just a bit, I, I'm a little bit confused, um, Mr. Secretary. Uh, you talked about the increased funding required in, in your budget submittal. Uh, in order to, uh, to create this robust permitting process, yet uh, you've testified and my colleagues have pointed out uh, the decreases in, um, in, in permits uh, in previous years. Why do you need so much money uh, to get back to an acceptable level of permitting? We were there before. Why, why is it different now? I think there's a, uh, Congressman Johnson, uh, I think there is a reality that uh, the American public and uh, the American Congress, and I think all of us should take into account, and that is there's a pre-Maconda time frame and a post-Maconda time frame. And I think if you look at the 30 years before Maconda, uh, there was not uh, the right kind of caution that was taken and the right kind of uh, inspection and, and oversight and technology that allowed us to get into deeper and deeper waters, essentially got ahead 
of our ability to deal with uh, safety issues, environmental issues, and other kinds of issues. And so what we want to do is to achieve a goal, which I think we can agree on, and that is that we want to have oil and gas production in the nation's oceans and have specified the area as the Gulf of Mexico as the area which is the most promising, which already contributes about 30 percent of the domestic production of oil to the United States. But we want to do it in a way that's going to be safe. And in order to do that, you need an agency that can do the job. The former MMS simply did not have the capacity to do the job. I don't mean to cut you off, Mr. Secretary. I can see that my time is, is about to expire. You testified, and, uh, and I've heard uh, other colleagues here mention it. Uh, oil is an international market, and according to your testimony, uh, the United States, we have very little influence over, uh, over the price of oil. Uh, I will submit to you that I think that's exactly what terrifies uh, the American public, that we seem to have our hands behind our back. Uh, and, uh, and this lack of permitting, this lack of going after resources that we have right here in America uh, and falling prey to that philosophy is, is indicative of a failed energy policy. Uh, so with time, that, I yield back my time. Yeah, time of the gentleman has expired. Gentleman from Florida, Mr. Mr. Rivera. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for being here today. As, as you know, the Everglades and Big Cypress in my district are national treasures. I'm sure you would agree, and important economic resources for my state, for the state of Florida. Everglades restoration is a huge priority for me and for my entire Florida delegation. And I personally feel a, a tremendous responsibility to this issue because so much of the National Park and the Big Cypress Preserve fall within my congressional district. As we go forward, I also think it's important that all, this, all the stakeholders are involved uh, in determining what prudent steps can be taken now and, and in the future, particularly with the current economic climate, um, to achieve the goal that everyone, I'm sure, wants to achieve of, of restoring water flow in these areas. You have placed a, a great deal of emphasis on the Everglades as a, as a special landscape. Last year, you broke ground on a one-mile bridge uh, along a, a, an artery through the Everglades, the Tamiami Trail, as a first step to restoring water flow to Everglades National Park. And you also announced the selection of a, of a plan for additional bridging to restore that water flow. I also, as you well know, represent the Miccosukee Tribe of Indians. And I know you've recently met with them, and, and, um, and I've um, met with them as well. Um, the Miccosukee Tribe in my meetings have raised some concerns with regards to the construction of the uh, Tamiami Trail Bridge and the additional proposed bridging. Um, they've told me they strongly support Everglades restoration, but they also have some concerns regarding the, the uh, environmental soundness of the project and they're concerned that it might cause harm to culturally sensitive and archaeological and sacred and, and religious sites. So in order to perhaps bridge some of those concerns or allay some of those concerns, I'm wondering if you could tell me what considerations were given to alternate plans, uh, perhaps pre presented even by the, the Miccosukee Tribe of Indians, uh, for the bridge and the proposed additional bridging, what alternatives were considered? Uh, Congressman Rivera, let me uh, first uh, say to you that I appreciate uh, the leadership that you bring to the Everglades uh, Restoration Project. Uh, it is uh, a project which has received uh, strong bipartisan support in the past and in my view is uh, one of the most important uh, ecosystem restoration projects uh, not only in the United States but uh, literally in the entire planet as a world heritage site. And it's a uh, part of uh, you know, some of the parts of the budget that we're dealing with now, including Land and Water Conservation Fund, will help us uh, get to a reality of restoring the river of grass uh, in the Everglades. With respect to alternatives on the Tamiami Trail, uh, those are all looked at in a very extensive way through all the environmental uh, impact uh, analysis that went into uh, the uh, construction on the Tamiami Trail and, and the proposed additions. There have been robust uh, conversations with the tribes uh, to make sure that their input is being heard and uh, that uh, robust uh, uh, consultation with the tribes will continue. Well, I appreciate that. I know your department has, been, has had meetings with them. Um, I have as well. And I'm wondering perhaps one of the most robust ways we can encourage that, that communication perhaps would be communication or meeting directly between the chairman of the tribe, uh, Kali Billy, and, and perhaps yourself. 
Uh, and I'm wondering if you would be open to direct uh, meeting or direct communication perhaps here in, in Washington that, that I could maybe help facilitate. Would you be open to meeting with, with the tribe? Yes. Um, also, finally, can you tell me going forward as we, as we plan for Everglades restoration in the, in the years ahead and ensuring that the national park and other areas you manage are, are preserved, what do you envision, what else can be done uh, to make sure that not only water flow is restored, but that this treasure is preserved for generations to come? Congressman Rivera, I think that uh, what had happened, uh, frankly, until two years ago, uh, is that for about an eight-year time frame, there was uh, literally very no progress being made in terms of Everglades restoration. We have uh, done a lot in the last two years, and we've done it by getting the uh, House of the Federal Family in order uh, and have invested significant uh, resources in uh, getting the Everglades to where they should be today. Uh, however, that has depended on the partnership that we've had with uh, farmers and landowners and ranchers and the state of Florida and local governments and the South Florida Water Management District, which has been a, a great partner as we have moved forward. And the tribe. And the tribe. And, and the most important thing that we can do uh, to bring the project across the finish line in, uh, in success uh, is to continue that partnership that has been underway for the last two years. Thank you. I appreciate those remarks. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. Uh, Chair, note, Mr. Chair, or Mr. Secretary, that we have only two more questionnaires, and that will coincide perfectly with the, your time frame of uh, 1 o'clock. So the timing is everything on this. At this time, I'd recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Denham, for five minutes. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. Uh, let me first start by thanking you. I know you've uh, spent some time in, in the Central Valley uh, looking at the uh, devastation with the water policy that we've had. I know there have been a number of questions on that, uh, and I've got a number of questions as well, but I'd like to get uh, your full attention and, and detailed answers on it, so I'll submit those to you. Uh, so let me just address a couple of, of funding questions uh, um, that I've got concerns with. I also represent not only the Central Valley, uh, but Yosemite and, and some of the mountain areas, and specifically uh, in Tuolumne County, one of the concerns that we have is the, uh, the cuts to the Secure Rural Schools program. Um, I guess I would be okay with the cuts if we were going to start doing more logging again, and you know they would have that, that additional revenue, but uh, absent new policy, we certainly uh, would need some type of plan on keeping those schools obviously open and funded. First, I ask you to address that that area of cut um, and the phase out of that. I know the governor or the president's new proposal has a phase out in it. Uh, Congressman, I, my understanding is that within the Department of Agriculture, there is uh, an amount. I believe it was three hundred twenty-eight million dollars from uh, testimony that I gave yesterday in the Department of Agriculture, and we will work closely with them in terms of the Secure Rules uh, funding. It's something that I have been aware of and have worked with uh, the California and Oregon delegations in, in, the, in the past, so I'm aware of the issue. I don't know the specifics with respect to the area that you speak about, but we will look into it. On uh, your other issues on Central, uh, the Central Valley and the water issues, uh, I would say the Deputy Director of the Department of Interior has probably spent more time working on that, on that issue than any single other issue it is exceedingly complex, but uh, there is. is great possibility and great hope that uh, if we can keep the water users and uh, the other interests together, that we can make some major breakthroughs on the California water issues in the Central Valley uh, this year. So we are very hopeful we're working on it together. And uh, just a quick comment on Yosemite. Uh, I, Yosemite has a special place in uh, the heart of the conservation community in uh, this country because it was set aside by President Lincoln right in the middle of midst of the Civil War. And it's what makes our country, uh, as uh, Ken Burns and Dayton Duncan would say in uh, their uh, movie uh, or in their film, uh, America's uh, best idea. And uh, so what he was able, what Abraham Lincoln started in uh, 1865 with Yosemite is a tradition that I hope we're able to continue working together in a bipartisan way uh, for a lot of reasons, but also because it contributes so significantly to the economy of uh, our country whether it's the Everglades or whether it's Yosemite or whether it's uh, Olympic or Rainier or other of our great national parks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a couple quick questions on uh, purchasing property. I mean, one of the things that I'm seeing now, we just finished duck season. Uh, my uh, duck license was very expensive. Now I see uh, $25 going up. Uh, first of all, 
Um, do we really need to buy more land right now? Are the, are the hunters not doing a good job of, of protecting the, the conservation of that area? And uh, uh, specifically on the wildlands uh, piece, I know BLM is talking about uh, greater resources and benefits and, and being able to use properties, and it seems like it's somewhat in conflict with, with wildlands. I mean, there are a number of prop, uh, policies that I'm seeing move forward where we're actually going out and buying more property, and uh, at the same time, we have the president who now is putting together a new commission to sell property. So in a time of fiscal crisis, it would seem that you know, we would agree with the, the, the president's direction to sell properties. The question is, how do we do that? And then secondly, why would we be going out and buying more property at a time that we're going through today? First, let me say that on uh, the acquisition of properties, I would uh, I know for a fact uh, that uh, hunting organizations from the National Riflemen's Association to Ducks Unlimited, Trout Unlimited, are uh, strongly supportive of uh, protecting uh, those areas that are a special place for hunters. Hunting adds a huge amount to uh, the economy of this country. It's a sport which uh, I strongly support. And when you have uh, lands that over the last 10 years have been disappearing, which have been uh, prime uh, uh, hunting uh, and wildlife habitat at a rate of uh, the size of Connecticut uh, every year. Uh, it uh, should call us to action to invest in uh, the protection of these lands that are special lands for uh, hunting and uh, for uh, disappearing uh, kinds of wildlife values. Are they vanishing? Disappearing? They are. They are moving essentially as uh, you. Uh, they, they are moved. They have moved over to development in in very significant ways. I mean, our population, as it has grown and is projected to continue to grow, will uh, continue to have these lands diminished. And so having a proactive conservation program in a partnership way that respects private property rights is something that uh, we very much support. And it's at the heart of the America's Great Outdoors concept. It's, it's at the heart of this budget. I said earlier, the, I mean, one of the great examples is what the ranching community, these are working ranchers, fourth, fifth generation ranchers that took the lead creating the Kansas, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Flint Hills National Conservation Area to protect 1.1 million acres of the last remaining of the tall grass prairie in North America. These are ranchers who said they want their way of life preserved in ranching. It's good for the economy of Kansas, and it's good for the environment. So I think we can Ta move forward with that agenda. Time of the gentleman uh, has expired. Uh, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Sutherland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for being here today. Um, I think you've been secretary for a little over two years. Is that correct? Yes, sir, that is correct. How many employees uh, are under your direction? <clears throat> around uh, 70,000. And uh, your budget for uh, 2010 was somewhere, I think, a little over 12 billion, correct? That's correct. Um, I congratulate you. That's an enormous responsibility. I mean, I'm a small business owner. I can't imagine having uh, that much uh, uh, responsibility. Uh, I wanted to ask you, you know, I, I live in uh, Florida. Uh, we were affected. My district had eight counties on the Gulf. Um, I, I wanted to ask you some, some, um, some questions regarding the Deepwater Horizon. You know, the president formed the uh, commission on the uh, BP and the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Did you participate in, uh, in that report? Did you have any um, work or, or uh, consultation responsibilities in that report? We, uh, I appeared before the commission, uh, provided uh, extensive testimony along with uh, Deputy Secretary David Hayes and a number of other people from the Department of Interior. Okay, so so your input was included. Obviously, it had an effect on the report that that Senator Graham and Mr. Riley came and presented before this body a few months about a month ago. Uh, they were an independent commission, but we did provide them whatever information they requested from us. Um, they had nine findings. Um, that they presented uh, before us, 400 pages, um, and um, uh, none addressed uh, any government's responsibility in the exasperation of, of, of that disaster uh, in the wake of that. Uh, I'm just curious, do you feel from your vantage point over 70,000 people, $12 billion, all the, does the government bear any responsibility having issued 720 violations uh, and, um, in, in, in the wake of that disaster, any? Congressman uh, Sutherland, I think that uh, the Deepwater Horizon was a tragedy that was brought about by a huge number of circumstances, including government inattention and government inaction. That I'm just I'm curious on, on, on if, if I may 
te I mean, I'm the last one here. So, I mean, time is a precious commodity. Um, as far as a percentage, I mean, I mean, does the government bear five percent, ten percent? What? What? You're you're a smart man. You, they don't give this position to somebody that can't speculate a little bit. Um, I, I mean, is, is there any? I mean, what what do you think? What do you? I would say to you that the honest answer that is not an all, at all a political answer, I think it's just the, the facts, is that uh, the former agency, MMS, uh, simply was not given the tools uh, by the Congress nor overseen by the executive branch of government to do the job that was so critical in this, in this table and in this committee several years ago. We testified about the need to have organic legislation for MMS. And what you have in front of you with this budget is an effort to try to stand up a robust agency that can accomplish these very significant missions that we have assigned to this particular bureau. Okay, but 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 clearly, if you had the ability to issue 720 citations or or for violate 720 violations, uh, and and we seem to be able to 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 not be able to rescind the Jones Act when we had offers from around the country to bring in skimming ships to help us at least contain uh, the disaster. Uh, cl clearly, there, there has to be, I mean, you've you got to be a smart man, 70,000 people, that's mind-boggling to me. Um, you have to be able to, 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 to agree that, that the administration and government could have done more. And, and, I, and I know you keep throwing it on Congress, but I'm talking about you. 70, you don't get $70,000, $12 billion without having some ability to make a difference, correct? Well, first, That's just a yes or no. I'm running out of time here. <laughs> Let me say, we did a, I think, a Herculean job in responding to the tragedy. Was it perfect? No. Uh, was it anticipated uh, and all the problems uh, foreseen? No. Uh, have we learned from it? Uh, I would hope we have learned from it, and part of uh, the lessons learned are incorporated into the budget requests that we have. Can I, can I ask you, but, but uh, now I'm on the, the yellow light, um, do we have, um, uh, after 720 findings, and, 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 and I, again, that's, a, that's, that's amazing to me, uh, have there been any disciplinary actions that have led to firings or dismissals from any of the individuals that, that were a part of citing those violations and issuing those citations? Yeah, we, that's just yes or no. Any, anyone fired? Over the last two years, there have been a number of disciplinary actions. That anyone have, fired, yeah. though? There have been people fired, people who have been prosecuted, uh, people have uh, appropriate ap action has been taken as we've cleaned up MMS over the last two years. Okay. I know you stated uh, when Mr. Costa was ta uh, questioning you, you stated that you had the ability uh, to focus like a laser beam. I mean, you, that was your words about an hour and a half ago. Um, and, and, and I would just encourage you, uh, being in the position you are with 70,000 people, $12 billion, uh, obviously a great skill set to get, be given that, and you have the ability to focus like a laser beam, that, um, that, that, that at some point in time, someone from your administration, or you even yourself, would be able to say, you know what, we screwed up. I think the American okay. people would, would appreciate um, uh, and, and I'm not ignoring the fact that time, that BP, time of the gentleman has expired. And uh, if there was a question there, uh, I'd ask the secretary to respond uh, to that question. <laughs> we just say there is a collective responsibility that has to be shared over what happened in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, thank you very much, and I, I, I think that all of us on this committee have always felt that uh, that that issue, as brought up by the gentleman from Florida, was a legitimate one to be discussed. Secretary Zalazar, thank you very much uh, for being here, and I want to thank all the members uh, for adhering as closely as we could possibly do to the five-minute rule. If there are further questions from any members of the committee, uh, Mr. Secretary, I'd ask you to uh, to respond to those questions as they come in as uh, timely manner as you possibly can. If there's no further business before the committee, uh, the panel is dismissed and the committee stands adjourned. Thank you very much. The 60 billion, I think it's the tax. Next, the Frontline Club discussion on the Middle East protests. Then Health and Human Services Secretary Kathleen Sebelius testifies before a House Energy Subcommittee on the 2012 budget.